here. Um, audio. There we go. <laughs> Thank you, Steve. So now we are being recorded. So this is also being broadcast on Zoom. So there are folks uh, watching from home on Zoom. And we'll when we get to Q&A, we'll do questions from both in the room and on Zoom. Um, there will be a recording of this available um, that I think will be uploaded to the Osterville Li Library's YouTube page. Um, and I'll probably send that recording link around to a few folks. And um, I know sometimes we get these requests, um, I can send around or I have my business cards here um, that I'll put on this table here. Um, if you'd like a copy of the presentation, uh, the PowerPoint slides after tonight and or the recording, just, just send me an email um, and I will send that to you. And I'll, I'll probably send that to Suzanne and a couple other folks in the room right now coordinate sort of emails and groups and activities uh, as well. So it's great to be with you all. And uh, I'm gonna go through the PowerPoint presentation here briefly, and then we mainly wanna just get to questions and Q&A. Hopefully we can go quick. And um, you know, I know there's a good, good amount of weather out there that folks might wanna get home. And I know I wanna say in advance that Councilor Cusack has a, a town council meeting tonight at seven in case he needs to, to duck out. So um, we all know why that is. So uh, we'll get right into it here. Oh, so Steve, please advance the slide. Oh, okay. I, I believe the slides are on your end, Pat. Oh, okay. Yeah, you that. <laughs> Let's see. Oh, here we go. Figure that out. So folks on Zoom, I just want to say this. At any point, if you want to raise your hand or put a question um, in the chat, um, you can either write a question, put in the chat, and Steve will read it. Um, or if you want to be unmuted and ask your question yourself, just raise your hand and and he'll do that. And we'll kind of go back and forth between in the room and on Zoom. Just some explanation here on the slide for folks uh, who are on Zoom. So just a quick introduction. I'll introduce the members of our team who are here in a moment. We'll give an overview of Commonwealth Wind and where things stand on the permitting end and then some uh, next steps. So in the room here tonight, Ken Kimmel is our Vice President of Offshore Wind Development who just spoke. I'm Pat Johnson, External Affairs Manager. Over here is my colleague, Grace Lane, um, who does events and operations and outreach with us. Um, Rachel Lake is over there, is our outreach coordinator for Massachusetts. Ken Fitzgerald um, in the gray jacket um, is with Stantec. Um, they're our engineering consultant. And then Aaron Harizzi is our permitting manager for Commonwealth Wind. So that's who you have in the room. And we have some other colleagues who are on Zoom too. Um, my colleague, Steve Tedros, is running the Zoom tonight. And then I have, we have some other members of our team who are also following along on Zoom as well. So how did we get here? We just wanna give a bit of a, a context to start of how we got to this point of these offshore wind projects advancing, especially because for so many of us who have been on Cape Cod um, for, for many years, we all followed the Cape Wind project and the uncertainty of that and um, the, the failure of that. Um, and then in the intervening years, um, we've seen now offshore wind being a reality embraced by the federal and state governments. So just to give a little bit of direction. So there's been a series of uh, laws that have passed in the legislature, especially the 2008 Global, Global Warming Solutions Act, which really began the push towards um, sort of more organized offshore wind competitive procurement process in Massachusetts. And under the Obama administration, federal siting for offshore wind projects began in 2010. If you can see on this slide, and I will say I printed out some copies of the deck here. So if anybody wants a hard copy, if you're having trouble seeing, please come up by Ken. And um, there's some hard copies available if you'd like. Um, it was a number of pages, so I, I did about 10 of them. Um, but we will also share the slides mm -hmm. after. We can see originally there was um, a very large lease area um, originally proposed, and then over time it was it was um, shrunk, especially with feedback from fishermen um, and uh, folks uh, who advocate for right whales, uh, avian species, birds, etc. So that uh, ended up being what you see in red is what actually got put out uh, for procurement, much less than what was originally anticipated. And you see this going on um, in what's going on in the Gulf of Maine as well. There's sort of a shrinking of what was the original scope of uh, of ocean area down to um, a, a a smaller area after stakeholder feedback. And that is sort of uh, what you see on the screen is what's actually out there uh, in development. And what we're talking about here is the area in yellow. Uh, the bottom of that area is where the Commonwealth wind turbines will actually be 20 plus miles south of Martin's Vineyard. There was the first federal auction lease in 2015 um, where Vineyard Wind um, first purchased its lease area, the lease area that 
that we are now um, using um, and that what we're talking about here, that's when that was first purchased um, through a federal government auction. And then in 2016, another fee bill passed, which started the first procurement that led to the Vineyard Win One project and uh, further procurements from there until we uh, we won the procurement for Commonwealth Wind in 2021, which was the third Massachusetts offshore wind procurement. So that just shows you a little bit about um, our target um, for Massachusetts um, offshore wind procurement, currently at 5.6 um, gigawatts um, of, of uh, power. And um, governor, our new governor, Maura Healy, has indicated she wants to double that to about 10, uh, 10 gigawatts or 10,000 megawatts of offshore wind power. What we're talking about here, just thinking that this uh, image might be, I'll see if I can move this so folks can see. So what we're talking about here, these are the shaded in different colors, the three areas where the actual turbines will be, Vineyard Wind 1, uh, closest about 15 miles south of Chappaquiddick and Edgar Town on Martha's Vineyard in the sort of teal color, Park City Wind, the project landing its cables under Craigville Beach um, in Centerville in dark green, and then Commonwealth Wind proposed to land its cables under the Dowsters Beach parking lot in the light green. A little bit more about Commonwealth Wind. It's a 12,000 megawatt project. Um, it is in active state and federal permitting. Um, our anticipated um, operation date would be in 2028 for the project. Um, cables landing under the Dowsers Beach parking lot, the power plugging into the Eversource, uh, an integrated electric system, electric grid system in uh, West Barnstable at the Oak Street a substation um, operated by Eversource just north of, of Route 6. Um, on Oak Street. Some benefits, and see if I can, I've done this before, figure out how to hide this, uh, hide self view. I think that's what I need. Okay, that helps a little bit. Um, so a little bit more detail of um, what we're looking at in terms of benefit from the power. So this will be enough power for approximately 700,000 homes, equivalent of taking uh, 2.35 million US tons of carbon dioxide out of the um, emissions out of the, the atmosphere every year, or 460,000 uh, fossil fuel using internal combustion engine vehicles, duration of 11,000 direct full-time equivalent uh, job years. Um, and we hope in the future to uh, negotiate a host community agreement with the town of Barnstable um, that will lead to a series of tax revenue um, and host community fees um, coordination um, on a possible town sewer project, um, potential replacement of calm uh, water, water mains uh, for public drinking water, um, and other benefits to the residents. Just a little bit of an image just to show you what's involved um, in an offshore wind um, farm and in the entire project. I want to say at the outset that this image is not to scale um, by, any, by any sense, but just kind of shows you the different components so that we all know what we're talking about. So the wind turbines for this project will be 20 plus miles south of uh, Edgartown, south of Martha's Vineyard, over 40 miles um, south of the Dowsers Beach parking lot. There'll be the turbines out there with an offshore substation that it will initially filter the power. Um, and then the power will be uh, filtered through three um, export cables that will be buried under the seafloor from that area through federal waters between Martha's Vineyard and Nantucket. Um, into state and federal waters in Nantucket Sound and landing under the Dowsers Beach parking lot. Um, yeah. Once we land in the Dowsers Beach parking lot, we then proceed up um, roadways in the town of Barnstable. Uh, uh, to, how many turbines? I'm sorry? How many turbines for Commonwealth Wind? It's, un, it's a great question, Hector. So it's, it's, it's undetermined yet because we haven't, we haven't picked our turbine supplier yet. Right. In total, between the lease area that comprises Park City Wind and Commonwealth Wind, it would be, I think, about 132 total turbine positions. Unsure of the split between that of Park City Wind and Commonwealth. It'll depend on the, the megawatt yield right. per turbine. Um, but great question. So once we get out of the Dallas Beach parking lot through public roadways in Osterville and Marston's Mills um, into West Barnstable, where we'll plug into the electric grid um, at a substation owned by Eversource in West Barnstable. And we are proposing in our permit filings to build a new substation um, in West Barnstable on Oak Street across the street from the existing uh, Eversource substation on Oak Street in West Barnstable. And then into the electric grid that'll power homes on the Cape Islands and throughout Massachusetts. I have a question. Yeah. The onshore 
cover station, mm -hmm. you have it deflected next to the parking lot. Where you get that it's not at all to scale. So this would be between, as you see in this green here, um, this is just to fit it all on one slide. Um, between the Douse's lot to the Oak Street substation, West Barnstable is about six miles. That's the Ontario substation. Mm -hmm. So that'll be on Oak Street, West Barnstable, just north of the Route 6 uh, over Oak Street overpass. And all those lines are going to run underground from the beach to the substation? Yes, under roadways. And I'll get into a slide in a second to show you what roadways we're talking about. These are great questions. So in terms of the offshore export cable, just briefly, we have a shared um, export cable for the Vineyard Wind Project, Park City Wind, and Commonwealth Wind um, in federal and state waters coming up under three uh, parking lots, beach parking lots in the town. Um, and you can see in, in blue that, that route. So this offshore route was, was chosen with great care um, for a process led by the um, Bureau of Ocean Energy, Man Ocean Energy Management, a federal agency, uh, to pick this route. And we often hear a lot of uh, conversation about um, limiting the amount of sort of spaghetti of cables on the seafloor um, and limiting the environmental impact of where these cables are placed. And we're very pleased that between these three projects, we've come up with one shared route. These cables are going to be installed in next to each other, uh, not going all, all, all different ways, uh, different places, but in a very confined uh, area uh, from this, this lease area all the way uh, to the waters of the town of Bartsville. Yeah. Yep. What's the Muskegon variant? So that is for Commonwealth Wind, and that is something that's in our federal um, filings that will be, is a potential alternative that the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management may want us to put one or two of the Commonwealth Wind cables in that green variant instead of in the westernmost part of the blue corridor. So that's something that they're still deciding um, and that we're, we're talking about them with. So it's a potential variant um, for the westernmost Commonwealth Wind cables. And you can see this image there, Larry, up on the screen of the cables of how they'd be aligned. Um, Vineyard Wind, farthest to the east of that shared corridor, closest to Tuckernuck Island and Nantucket, um, and then Park City Wind in the middle, depicted in pink, and then Vineyard Wind would be the three cables uh, farthest to the west. So it's possible that Boehm will ask us to put one or two of the three Commonwealth cables in that green corridor instead of in the far western part of the blue corridor. And then that's because Commonwealth has more cables? It was the same number of cables? No, it's mainly about the amount of rocky bottom, as I understand it, and other fa factors in the seafloor in that area that it's possible they may want um, to bump one or two of them out farther west. It's mainly about the seafloor conditions in that area of Muskegon Channel is the main factor. It, it should be noted though, their original view was to do everything within that 1500 foot wide blue corridor to avoid having cables all over the place. So if they do pick the Muskegon one, that will be a change of position on, on their end. Yeah. Yeah. And, and one other thing is that um, we just need to maintain a certain amount of space between each cable. So that's one of the factors that will go into whether we have to utilize that. And, and folks might not see this, but those um, those uh, distances are depicted. So between the two vineyard wind cables are about 50 meters apart. And then the farthest west vineyard wind cable is 100 meters from the first Park City wind cable. Um, and then uh, there's about another 100 meters, meter spacing projected from the farthest west Park City wind cable depicted in pink um, to the the next common with wind cable. So that's the average space and we're talking about um, about 50 to 100 meters between uh, each of these cables. That's, yeah. What's the reason for the spacing? The reason Not to get too technical. No, sure. It's it's cable performance primarily. And Ken, you might be able to talk more about this. When you space cables properly, you do that in terms of um, the maximum performance um, and uh, lack of sort of interactions between the two cables. Thank you. It's also constructability. Oh, yeah. What yeah. about a heat? Huh? The heat given off by the cables uh, factor. Oh, Ken, it might be more in your bailiwick. I don't know if you can talk about yeah, I think cable. The primary factor for the subsea cables is actually constructability. Uh, you, you want to maintain a construction tolerance to have one cable construction not impact what might already be installed. All right, so then. Um, the heat, uh, fact. Not so much uh, uh, offshore. What about onshore where it goes under the roadway? Mm -hmm. That gets evaluated. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, that, that gets evaluated um, uh, in a lot of detail to ensure that uh, primarily that there's no uh, degradation of electricity. No degradation of electricity, but degradation of the program. Yeah. Yeah. 
Well, that's why we'll get in a second to the construction of the uh, onshore duck bank for the cables. And let's let me show that slide in a second. We'll, I think, be able to talk about that in a little bit more detail. Excuse so, a lot of, I'm sorry, go ahead. I just wanted to ask regarding his question mm -hmm. on the heat. Yeah. This is your first ever wind farm project, right? You guys have no experience doing this before. So, how are you going to quantify the um, the effects that you're going to have if it's never been done before and nothing has ever been built at this size megawatts? And I'm surprised to see that in previous meetings it was always 1,200. These slides say 1,200 plus megawatts. So now you're going higher than 1,200 megawatts. There's no experience anywhere. Am I right, Panther? It's not true. And actually, so I, I, I'm glad you brought that up. I, I heard um, Hector during the Save Dallas's Beach meeting on Tuesday, Hector um, had said that on Tuesday night. So that that's not true. So first of all, we are a co-developer, 50% owner, and they're a good deal of Avangrid employees actively working on the current installation of the Vineyard Wind Project in okay. Cobles Beach. Oh, let me let me just, I'll, and I'll promise I'll let you uh, uh, make further statements. So that's, that's the first piece. The second piece is we are part of a larger company. Um, our Auburn Grid is owned by the Eber Driller Group, which owns a series of um, offshore wind companies that have decades of experience um, in offshore wind installation. We own Scottish Power, we own Eber Driller Mexico, that company. Um, so we have team members, thankfully, in our team who have experience on those projects and who have come from those offshore wind companies that our radar company is part of. The next thing is, there is no current offshore wind industry yet. No company has this experience yet because this is a new industry in the United States. In the United States. Um, there is one current operating offshore wind farm anywhere in the United States, and that's the five turbine Block Island um, wind farm off of the coast of Rhode Island. So there is no, the only company that has experience is the Vineyard Wind um, Project is the first one. Um, and we do have lots of experience um, with um, through our, through our other companies that are part of our larger parent company, the Drill Group, in this work. We also have um, considerable experience in onshore wind um, across the country. We're the third largest onshore wind uh, company in the entire, in the entire United States. Um, so we have considerable um, uh, experience in building and erecting turbines in an onshore environment um, and all of the related um, on construction and cables and all that. Uh, for an onshore wind uh, turbine setup. So um, I would say we're poised as well as any other company um, operating in the U.S. to do this work. Right, and I, with all due respect, mm -hmm. I would say that you're yeah. as well poised as any other company, mm -hmm. but all of the wind projects that I have read about in the United States haven't been too successful. I think Black Island is not doing well, correct? No, Black Island, I mean, that's supplying power to the to the island of Block Island, the, the voters and the residents of Block Island decided to take their energy future into their own hands and and work with their utility company with Orsted to build that um, wind farm. I, I've heard that there has been a couple issues. There's going to be issues with any energy project, but that's operational and serving the needs of, of that community in a small. I mean, I wonder, if folks, I'm happy to take some questions, but maybe we can get through the slide deck and we'll take every question at the end if you don't mind. I oh, we could we could. Uh, let me just get through these and then let's let's get to the Q9. I, I appreciate it. So this is folks often ask about what alternatives um, did we look at uh, for the landing for this project? So what we have up here is we really, um, as we prepared to bid this project in 2021 to the state of Massachusetts, um, we, we first looked at could we land and probably was the first option was landing uh, the cables for this project in the Craigville Beach parking lot like the Park City Wind. Uh, project that would have definitely been um, a great option. Um, but as as folks know, Craigville Beach has a huge parking lot um, and lots of space. But the problem is the roadways out of Craigville Beach um, parking lot. I uh, go Craigville Beach uh, going towards toward, towards Hyannis from Cobles Beach as the Vineyard Wind is using that roadway uh, towards Hyannis, and then the Park City Wind project is using the Craigville Beach roadway crossing the Centerville River um, up into the village of Centerville. Uh, for their duck bank project. Um, we couldn't put um, both projects duck banks under that section of Craigville Beach Road. Um, and that was not feasible. We looked at it over and over again, um, could not make that work. We looked at some other options, including Cobbles Beach for second landing, that didn't work. Um, we looked at the boat ramp on East Bay, which is E, 
Um, we looked at McCarthy Landing. We looked at the Wiano Ave Landing, which is too small. We looked at Loop Beach and Katuit. We looked at the Katuit uh, Boat Landing uh, in B. Um, all for various reasons could not work. Now, why are we mainly looking at primarily um, locations within the town of Barnstable in Centerville and Osterville? Well, there's a couple of reasons. One is that there are cables, um, existing other cables um, that we don't want to cross. For this project, we wanted our cables to not cross the cables that are planned uh, for the Park City Wind Project and the cables that are currently being installed for Vineyard Wind going into Cobles Beach and Craigville Beach. So essentially we had to stay to the west. Um, we also have, um, there's an existing national grid owned cable um, from Calmus Point in Hyannis that has duck bank infrastructure under Ocean Street um, in Hyannis up to Calmus Beach um, that, goes to Nat that goes to Nantucket. Um, so we wanted to stay to the west of that. So primarily um, we looked at locations in, um, in the west end of Barnstable in Osterville and in Ketuit. Um, why not Mashpee? Why not Falmouth? Why not further to the west? Well, the main reason for that is that we have a substation Q position, which is the only place that we have ability to connect the 1200 plus megawatts for this project. And thank you for what is 1200 megawatts plus. We have a separate 32 megawatt um, power purchase agreement um, with a series of municipal light plants. Um, so at present, the Commonwealth Wind Project is actually 1232 um, megawatts of power. So that's part of the reason for the, the plus. Um, so we can only connect the power for this into the Eversource substation in West Barnstable because that's where we have a 1200 megawatt Q position. We don't have Q positions um, anywhere else on the Cape that we could plug this power into and there's no feasible way to get that Q position. Um, some folks, again, there was a lot of information shared at the, the Save Douses Beach meeting on Tuesday. Um, and one thing that was mentioned and asked is there's this uh, potential of a South Coast variant for Commonwealth Wind of going to Fairhaven or New Bedford or um, uh, cushioning it over to that area. The only other Q position that our company owns in Massachusetts where we could plug in offshore wind power is a 400 megawatt Q position in a cushion it, which is a community just uh, just north uh, east or north uh, east of New Bedford. Um, so we could only put a third of the power, only one cable or the three cables into that into that substation. Um, that was not found to be feasible. We'd still need to do um, the rest to uh, the Dowses Beach parking lot and into the West Barnstable um, substation. So our determination and what we put in our permit filings is that the by far the best option to limit environmental impact and keep the integrity of our offshore export corridor and cables is to put uh, the three cables for Commonwealth Wind uh, under the Dowsers Beach parking lot and connect them to the West Barnstable substation. Why not Mashpee? It's far too long of a distance. Let's say we looked at South Cape Beach parking lot um, or another location of Mashpee, the distance would be untenable onshore, the length of construction delay, the route options on main roads um, like Route 28, um, not preferable. Um, so that those are many of the reasons why that have gotten us to this point of why um, we are proposing to land this power under the Dowsa Beach parking lot and connect in West Barnstable. I'll go through these quickly, the remainder, so we can get into uh, questions. How is this, uh, these, how are these three cables going to be installed under the Dowsa Beach parking lot? So this is an image that shows how that would be done. It would be uh, through a cable lay vessel Kind of similar to what folks see right now off of Coble's Beach, that, that big uh, vessel that's doing cable pull for the Vineyard Wind Project in the Coble's Beach parking lot. So there'd be a vessel about 220 feet, almost about a half a mile off Dowsey's Beach um, doing that installation. They would um, tunnel and install casing pipe um, straight down um, below the seafloor and then proceeding uh, toward the beach um, and then a gradually increasing um, under uh, increasing elevation and then actually landing the cable infrastructure under the paved parking lot. So that means we'll be tunneling under the dunes, under the beach. Uh, we won't be trenching, digging up, tearing up any part of the beach dunes, um, any of the marsh area, any of the um, East Bay, um, et cetera. Um, we will just be staying within the paved surfaces of the parking lot and out, and out the, the causeway uh, leading from East Bay Road into the parking lot. 
Um, and we'll have three, three of those. Three times. Sorry? That'll happen three times. Three times, three different, that vessel installing three different, um, basically tunnels. That's right, Suzanne, um, with casing pipe that the ca three different cables will go through in three different locations in the Douse's lot. And I'll show that in a second. So that's during construction, the vessel, um, and then put, installing that um, infrastructure. And then after construction, the infrastructure and that um, casing pipe uh, filled tunnel, essentially under the beach and surfacing under a lot will be in place. And then just want to reiterate a couple points I just made. No trenching, um, no construction um, will take place in the dunes, the marsh, the shoreline, um, the, the, other, um, the other areas, we, grass areas we see depicted here. Uh, no construction between Memorial Day and Labor Day. This will be in the, the non-summer months. Um, and the parking lot will be repaved and completely open um, during those summer months. Just in terms of what that shows, this is what, this is what the construction looks like. Um, we would fence off um, areas in, in a two-phased approach, um, especially to seek to maintain public access um, in, uh, in the lot. And we would do this drilling, but then when it's done, this is what uh, Cobles Beach looked like um, once uh, everything was repaved uh, before Memorial Day last year. Um, and that's what it would look like for the summer months, same for Um This just, again, um, sort of talks a little bit about the construction activity. This shows the phasing. Um, we propose to do one of the three cable landings sort of toward the front end of the lot near where the beach umbrella is, only in the paved surface. And the, we'd see sort of depicted as perimeter fencing. So we would still have um, one lane, the far lane closest to East Bay uh, open, and there would be um, detail officers or, or civilian flaggers um, directing traffic, pedestrian and vehicles in that one lane. Um, so that the far end of the beach parking lot would still be um, open um, for the public during that period. And then we do the other two in the far end of the lot um, closest to where the handicap pier is. Um, and during that period, um, the handicap pier would be blocked off by this fencing um, and by this, cave, this, this insulation, but we would do everything um, we can to um, figure out ways to maintain access to that handicap pier um, via alternative methods. Um, and that is how we would do this in a phased approach. And when we're in the far end of the lot by the handicap here, um, we would um, keep the front end of the lot open and repaved for the public to use. The only time um, where there would be potentially a full closure of a lot is when we're doing the construction within the causeway um, and installing the duck bank within the causeway and over top of the culvert. <laughs> This shows the two route options. So here's sort of the main factors, and this is what we put in our environmental notification form. And I do want to thank so many of the folks um, who, who presented comments and submitted comments to MEPA um, this, this past fall um, for that. Um, so there are two route options that we're carrying through permitting. The first that we call our preferred, out, preferred route would be what, let's call this the main street route. So folks will be obviously very familiar with coming out of Douse's Beach, left on East Bay Road, right on Wieno Ave, proceeding north from there, um, turning into Main Street, proceeding north on Main Street, bearing right on Osterville West Barnesville Road, crossing 28 on Osterville West Barnesville Road, north to Old Falmouth Road, bearing right there, and then proceeding north to the substation location on Oak Street. So that's route option one. Um, sort of thoughts and what we put in the ENF on that. Um, the plus is the town has indicated they plan to put sewer, to sewer um, these roads, particularly Osterville West Burnsville Road from 28th and South um, mm -hmm. into Osterville Village Center. Um, and the town manager indicated when he was before the Osterville Village Association, um, especially back in August, uh, that if we chose this route, the town would seek to uh, install sewer uh, concurrent with our, uh, with our construction project. Um, and that would lead potentially to the, the village of Osterville and these, some of these roads, particularly getting sewer 10 years earlier than currently planned in the town's comprehensive wastewater management plan. So that would be potentially a significant benefit, particularly with the action coming from Mass DEP, changing Title V septic system regulations. Um, this could be a, a positive for 10 years earlier of sewer and hacking, 10 years earlier of uh, reducing the amount of nitrogen coming into the three bays, um, increasing yeah. the amount of nitrogen uh, or sort of uh, reduction of nitrogen. Um, in the entire watershed, especially since Mass DEP is going to be likely enforcing these new regulations by watershed. 
Um, so there's a lot of potential benefits to that approach. Detriments, which we fully and completely admit and understand, is that we there are a lot of businesses um, on these roads, um, particularly on Wiano Ave. This would be potentially going right in front of the library uh, where we sit now um, and proceeding uh, through part of the, the uh, Osterville Business District and Osterville Village Center. That would be that would have impacts, that would have inconvenience. We completely understand that. Um, on one side, the town is going to do a big sewer project with a ton of construction and a deep 15 foot trench at some point on these roads anyways. Um, so one, one might say there's let's get it done um, and the town could work with um, Avangrid and Commonwealth Wind to do this in 2025 to 2027, get it done and have Avangrid take over a great deal of the construction costs. Uh, the alternative might be that's too much impact on the business district. Um, so that's where we get into the alternative route in blue, which would be East Bay Road going the other way, Ross and Main Street onto Old Mill Road uh, to Five Corners Road, um, I think a stretch of Bumps River Road and Lumbert Mill Road, and then eventually also getting onto Old Falmouth. Um, as folks are probably familiar with those series of roads, pretty much all residential. Um, we'd be essentially east of uh, Fancy's Market, um, really wouldn't cross by any um, businesses. It would just be a residential route. Um, so that would be less impact um, to businesses in particular um, and to traffic generally. The alternative though is that those roads, Old Mill, Five Corners, et cetera, are not in the town's wastewater plant. They're not slated to be sewered. Uh, so there'd be no sewer benefit and millions of dollars of uh, sewering cost savings for town taxpayers uh, for a sewer project that's gonna happen anyways. So those are sort of some of the trade-offs that we're talking about. We'd love to hear folks thoughts and questions when we uh, get to that. This just shows uh, the, the road names, which I think I just named, all of them for the alternative route. This is underground utility infrastructure. What does a duct bank look like? And what does it look like when it's done? So this is a, a cement encased duct bank system where the cables uh, would be placed um, under the roads. And we'd have a similar duct bank system proposed for within the, the causeway. Um, this would then be under pavement, and the only thing you would see, similar to kind of what you see down the center of Craigville Beach Road near Cobles Beach now, is those manhole covers. Um, and some of those are new that you see down the center of Craigville Beach Road uh, now that have recently been installed. And those are access manhole covers, so that if there was ever an issue with a section of the cable that needed to be repaired or replaced, we could access that um, through the manholes. Um, without needing to tear up the road. Um, so that's a key part for maintenance um, and, and uh, reducing future disruption to the community uh, when we do operations and maintenance um, of our cables. Um, but that's essentially what a duct bank looks like. Sir, to your question, um, the cables, and, and Ken, add to this if, if you'd like, um, the cables will be placed um, within cement and then in certain places also be thermal concrete. Um, in uh, over top and, and used as well uh, to reduce and dissipate any heat. And the alignment of the way the cables are placed within the cement duct bank um, is expressly done in order to uh, maintain the maximum performance of the cables and also to limit uh, heat or interactions between the cables. I don't know if Ken, did, did I get that right or any? You got it right and we do evaluate that. We, we run models that have been around for a long time. We actually develop a cross section of the duct bank that uh, generate isotherms I'll show that if you're a foot away from the, the duct bank, you will have a certain temperature. You get a little bit further out, it'll be less and less and less. And then armed with those data, what we do is we evaluate in conjunction with the interface and utilities, um, any impacts associated with utilities, whether it's gas or water or anything else. Can we ensure that uh, those utilities are, are properly placed in or insulated? As, as Thank you. Just a quick comment on that. Is that going to be a 115 kV circuit or 345? Uh, the yeah. underground circuits are 275 kV. 270. Yes, sir. Yeah. You've never presented in any of your presentations any health data about your cables that haven't even produced yet. And you're, we're going to go on blind faith that there isn't any electronic magnetic field concerns here where it has been well documented that has caused leukemia in children. Mm -hmm. And this is a I got a whole bookload of it. Mm -hmm. So you know I'm not in good faith listening to you because you haven't presented any foundation for us not to be concerned of the fact that you're going to put this through the whole time and we're just supposed to believe you. 
And it's all going right down people's homes. It's already been documented that these cables are harmful. And you're going to double the load coming through there that's never been done in the United States. And we're supposed to believe that. So, ma'am, and, and and I and I understand your concern. Um, I, I don't have I don't have medical I don't have medical. Oh, I do. I'm sorry. I do have that. Background. Understood. I don't have that in front of me here. Um, I'll say briefly, and then I'll turn it over to Aaron and and Ken. Um, this is the, the the benefit of underground utility infrastructure is to prevent um, the any electromagnetic field. Our duct banks won't have electromagnetic field. They have have, have a small magnetic field, um, which is very well researched. And Ken might be able to talk a little bit more about that. Um, but this is the express reason that we that we're burying this infrastructure versus all of the electric infrastructure that we have above ground that does not have the protection of being underground um, all around us um, right now and in power lines uh, throughout the community. But I don't know if Ken, you'd like to add or Aaron. Uh, yes, actually, there's a study that's just being published now that uh, the, the EMS study, as it's called, right. that uh, that models the the underground duct bank. It uh, calculates the magnetic fields. You're right, there are no electric fields, there are magnetic fields. And that report demonstrates uh, that uh, the, the levels are, are well within state guidelines for the underground stuff. Uh, and I, I think maybe we'll see. And there's, there's, yeah, so there's like international guidelines, there's no national or, or state guidelines that limit EMS. Um, but I think, I think the international, one of the lowest international guidelines is 2000 milligo. And any of the reading from our um, typical duct bank cross section is are well below, I think 100. I think they range from 38 to like 85. So where are the studies? You haven't presented any studies. Yeah. So you so as part of the energy facility siting board process, you do have to submit a. Uh, uh, an EMF report, well, and so that was shown before. We'll, we'll share. We'll share the report with everybody. We yeah. have a host community. We should have this information. Yeah. No. Yeah. If we did not. Yeah. We can. We can share that. We can make it available for everyone. Uh, Pat, I have a question. Uh, it's sure. More of a corporate structure. Mm -hmm. uh, it's related to his question, I think. <laughs> I understand the global company of Allen Grid. Mm -hmm. Is this work being done within the? confines of an LLC owned by the company? Can you answer that? It, it is, but um, there's multiple <laughs> ways in which the larger corporation guarantees the performance. That writing? It, it, it's part of our permit applications. It's part of the federal process we have to go through. There are performance guarantees. Uh, does everyone know what an LLC is? Yes, it's, yes, it's, yes, it's, yes. Uh, and the issue, the issue is, you know, it's 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 sort of a single source of revenue. So you want to look beyond that. And uh, there are going to be provisions that will do that. I should also point out, though, that these fixed price contracts guarantee a revenue stream over the next 30 years. Well, so I totally get that. Where yeah. I was going with, with, <clears throat> excuse me, with this woman's question. You know, if something goes wrong, and the LL, I mean, I I come from big corporate LLC yep. stuff, and well, guess what? The LLC is gone. Company will big. company will stand behind it. Oh. People get sick. Yeah. It will be. Is that company even grow? Oven grid. And can, can, where will that be documented? And what kinds of guarantees are you and we talked about this last week? And yeah, and I owe you an email on that. I haven't right. gotten to it yet. Right. I don't know the exact form. There are performance bonds, there are letters of credit, there's a number of financial instruments that will be required, for example, to guarantee that if a turbine, you know, gets uh, needs maintenance, that, that that gets done, that uh, the 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 facility gets decommissioned. There, there's a number of financial uh, surety mechanisms that okay, will happen. When will these be spelled out at what point during the permitting process? I, I think some of them are already in our federal construction and operation plan. But I, as I said to you, and when we talked to Park City, uh, I have it on my list of to-dos to get okay. back to on that. Okay. And I think just maybe folks, I, if we could just get through the rest of these slides and then we will yeah. uh, take more questions. That slide is very first. It's presumably at some point, Dallas Beach's parking lot, God forbid this ever went through, would have that. Okay, that's on the right hand side. We're going to cause me, yes, sir, under the table. What happens when you have a storm 
one tonight before, particularly the storm uh, before Christmas, which happens to me three, four times a year. So I'm going to say it at the point where the bay meets the ocean. What happens to that? What happens great, to your equipment? Great question, sir. So Ken Fitzgerald, Ken, can you come a little closer so that sure, the folks sure. have to uh, Yeah, you know, that's an excellent question. And this, this is fairly typical in, in um, underground construction. The cable uh, underground construction that takes place on a spit of land. Exactly. We, we do work in the seasides all the time, but to answer your question directly, the cable, the cable splices, the associated infrastructure is designed to summer underwater service. And your vehicles are too. <laughs> but what the vehicles overcome by water uh, that's that's doing the trenching and all this stuff. Uh, what happens to it? Okay, well, there's, there's two questions here. I was answering the question on, on the long term installation, what happens after it's built. Um, during construction, there's construction techniques that would need to be employed to uh, recover and get the construction work back on track. I would sure love to see that. Okay. Well, those well, details are, are certainly going to be worked out. We haven't gotten quite as far as working with construction companies yet. And is there a bid process that I'm just unfamiliar with? Bid process that the town of Barnstable goes through when they're when they're doing this. I mean, who who gets the bid? How did the bids come about? They said this is a good idea. Well, you get the bid. I mean, how, like, how did this happen? A, a bid for the, for the project or a bid yeah. for the work? Or I'm not sure what you're asking. The municipality has to look at several comp competing bids mm -hmm. and then say, this is the best bid. I want to know how this thing got off the ground in the first place. Yeah. Well, look, if the town is doing like a sewer project or something, it will do a competitive bidding because it's the town's project and they'll get a bunch of contractors to put in bids and they'll choose one. Um, in this case, um, <clears throat> The the way this came about was, um, as I think Pat explained, we have this offshore cable area that heads to the Cape. We have the right to connect to a substation. And so we've asked the town for permission to connect the Vineyard Wind project into Barnstable um, and the Park City one and now the Commonwealth Wind one. Um, and the town, we've had lots of discussions there. I know there's a slide that's going to get at this. There is a host community agreement that we've negotiated with the town for each of these projects, and we hope to do the same for this one. So the town is getting uh, enormous economic value out of this, which we can go over. But it's more, it's not a bidding process. It's us asking for permission and having dialogue with the town and coming to an agreement. There's a, there's a socket in the wall, and we're in the way of your, of your extension. Well, okay, you can frame it that way, but another way to frame it, is we're going to add uh, enormous economic revenue to the town and accelerate the sewering of the of this area to improve water quality and, and save the town we're many millions of dollars. Storm of yeah. Yeah. Well, you, sir, yeah. I, we're, this is a little ar more argumentative than I'd like it to be. It's not going to look like Galveston. Everything we're talking about is underground. So let me just let me just, let me finish these slides real quick. If you don't mind, Larry, and if I saw your hand, Bob. So let me just get these done, then we'll go to go to all Q and A. Just just going to get through these quickly. So this is where we're talking about for the substation location. I think we covered this and talked about this. We're talking about Oak Street North Route Six. Um, this is the existing in yellow orange um, on the east side of Oak Street where the existing Eversource substation is, and then in purple is depicted where we are planning to construct. Um, the new substation that is required for this project in order to filter the power and bringing it up to the kill vote uh, level that Eversource requires. Um, this is where we're at in the permitting process. We're um, about halfway, I guess, or, or, or so through the federal permitting process. I do want to make sure, and I'm going to say this um, at, at all the Park City Wind and come with me when meetings going forward so folks um, understand. Um, Park City Wind, the project landing under the Craigville Beach parking lot, Commonwealth Wind landing under Dallas Beach parking lot are being permitted federally together as an entity called New England Wind. And thank you, Suzanne, um, for bringing this up on your meeting on Tuesday and, and um, pointing out the confusion. Um, so if folks want to comment right now, and I'll show this in a second, there is a open comment period until February 21st on the federal permitting. And that really pertains to both Park City Wind and Commonwealth Wind since the federal permitting is done jointly. So we're in right now the stage where our draft environmental impact statement from the Federal Bureau of Ocean Energy Management um, is, is out for public comment right now. 
And then that shows you we've just started the MEPA process. We um, completed the filing of the ENF and the comment period. We're now working on our draft environmental impact report for MEPA. Uh, we recently filed for the Energy Facility Siting Board, and that process um, will kick off at some point in the next couple of months. We haven't yet filed any of the local or regional permits or permits with Mass DEP. Um, if you want to see these files, you can go to commonwealthwind.com slash permitting, commonwealthwind.com slash permitting, and the federal DEIS, our MEPA ENF, the Energy Facility Siting Board uh, petition are all on that website um, for, for folks uh, to review. This is the comment period, um, and uh, if, if you're interested, um, and uh, please email me um, if, if you're looking for more information. And Rachel, we should, I don't know if we've done this already, we need to make sure these dates are up on the permitting. They are. They are already. All right, so if you go to commonwealthwind.com slash permitting, these dates of these hearings, including a link to the BOEM website, uh, where to find the Zoom information is on commonwealthwind.com slash permitting, or you can search uh, New England Wind um, on the BOEM.gov website. Um, so you can submit public comments um, in writing um, or uploaded via the internet until February 21st. And then there are open Zoom meetings hosted by the federal government, the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management on January 27th, February 1st, and February 6th. Looking forward, this is what we're going to be working on in the next couple months. We're going to continue designing uh, the duct bank and underground utility infrastructure, um, continue designing the substation, can fit, continue the federal and state permitting, and begin preparations for the regional permitting and local permitting filings. And we're uh, going to continue uh, host community agreement discussions with the town of Barnstable. But I do want to say, um, especially given town manager Ellis has uh, put out a video, and I think probably will address this at the town council's meeting tonight, um, the town manager is pausing the active negotiations of the host community agreement um, with Commonwealth Wind um, until uh, we uh, we address our um, power purchase agreement, um, which we're currently working on, and, and Ken can can get into more in a moment. These are the next uh, uh, monthly meetings. We'll be here in person again on February 23rd from five to seven at the Osterville Library um, and on Zoom on Wednesday, March 22nd. Um, you can find these at commonwealthwind.com slash events, um, and we'll soon be announcing the April, May, and June dates, and we'll be doing these monthly going forward, a mix of Zoom and, and here in person at the library. This is my contact information. My business cards are also over here, and this is Rachel's contact information. My business cards are out front and room. Thank you, and uh, I think we're good. Let's, um, let's get into questions. <laughs> so we'll start with Bob, and then I think Larry had a question, and then we'll go from there. I guess I just want to go back to a comment Mr. Kimmel just made that uh, we're asking the town for permission to lay um, these cables. That's 180 degrees from what Mark L has said to the town. You referred the town talk video that was posted two days ago where he said, oh, they don't need our permission. They could very well do this regardless of what the town says. So what's the truth? And if the town were to say, you know what, residents don't want this, for a variety of reasons, would you go ahead and do this anyways? Yeah, so Bob, I think you've asked me that question a couple of times, but I'm happy to answer it again. We have asked the town for- No need to be snarky. Yeah. We, 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 we've asked for, we've asked, okay, fine. I, I withdraw it, sorry, sorry, sorry. No, fair enough. We've asked the town for all the permits that the town has the jurisdiction to grant. We wanna do this cooperatively with the town. That's how we do business. That's how we did the first project. That's how we're doing the second project. Um, what I think the town manager has been adverting to, though, there is a provision in state law. And one can argue whether it's a good provision or not. But when you're building large energy structures, if a town says no, the proponent does have the ability to go to the energy facility siting board and get an override. And I think the intent of it was Let's say you have a power line going across the state um, and one town says no and prevents the whole power line from being built. So there is this override that exists. And I think what the town manager is saying is if we weren't able to do this local permitting cooperatively, we would have the right to go to the siting board. Um, but that is not what we want to do. And that's not how we did it for Vineyard One or for Park City. Uh, we would like to do this consensually. We'd like to offer 
compelling benefits to the town so that this is something that they feel is also a good deal. Um, and we want to be working with you and answering your questions and also looking at local community benefits if there's some things we can do in the neighborhood that would be of interest to people as well. So that that's, I think, how you reconcile what we're saying about applying for the permits and what uh, the town manager is saying about ultimately where the permit authority lies. It does ultimately lie with the state. Okay, I just want to report, I'm going to go to, to Larry and then um, ma'am, you had uh, in a black jacket had a question next, but I just want to say, I'm going to stop sharing the screen because I'm hoping that by doing that, folks on Zoom and the recording will better capture uh, the, the camera. So please tell me, uh, see if that's incorrect, but um, I'm going to, I'm going to make that change and tell me if I need to change that. Okay, so I'm going to, and we'll put the slides back up if someone has a question on the slide. So let's go to Larry Hurwitz and then um, ma'am, you in the, the black jacket. I want to first reiterate that I'm on the fence on this project. But it's not, the gentleman asked a question as far as uh, bidding. Didn't you have to bid for the lease area to begin with? Yes, in 2015. Yes. Okay, and you're bidding your work out to contractors, correct? Yeah. Our various contracts for the construction? Yeah, for the construction. Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah. And, and these contracts, most of them look like from, uh, from Europe. So go uh, from Denmark. No, mix. Some of the offshore contractors, That's what I'm yeah, the, the offshore, offshore ones will be will, right. will not be. But the offshore pieces is, I think, what is we're asking a lot of questions on, like how are you going to land on Dallas Beach? What what it's going to? How are you going to put it in the water? <clears throat> and what I'm saying is, those contractors have the uh, the experience to do this work. Yeah, that correct. That is correct. Right. So I just wanted to you know answer the gentleman's question. Okay. You know, sorry, was, you know. Bidding and experience. Yeah. Well, well stated, ma'am. And then I think uh, you had the purple jacket next. Yeah. I think you had another question, ma'am. Oh, Susie. Oh, Susie. Okay. Yeah. Are you sure? Oh, yeah, okay. please. Okay. Um, so my question uh, has to do with uh, the aquifer. Mm -hmm. And I asked a, a bit of a question, a similar question at Senator Bill last week. Yeah. So if Barnstable was the only grid ready place ready to receive your 1500 megawatt electric cables, why is it necessary for Alvin Grid to build three new large substations in Independence Park, Shoe Flying Hill, and Oak Street, all scattered around with the worry of toxic chemicals leaching into our precious aquifer and source of drinking water? And also people that are on well water, a lot of people are on well water around that area. I just wondered how, I know you mentioned it to me last, but I have a terrible memory. Ken, <laughs> no problem. So I'd love you to. So maybe Ken, can you talk about how we're protecting at the yeah. substations groundwater? And then Ken, I'm hoping you can talk about the electrical or practical reason why we need these substations in the first place and why yeah. we need three. Yeah. Um, Cape Cod is a sole source aquifer. The groundwater <laughs> is uh, absolutely essential to the lifeblood of Cape Cod. In another life, I was the commissioner of the Mass DEP, and my job was to protect the groundwater of Cape Cod. So we really understand that. The only part of this operation that's going to have any fluids of any kind is the substation. And the town um, hired an independent engineer who insisted that we develop our substations in accordance with a standard that goes way beyond what, as far as I know, anyone else has done, and certainly way beyond, for example, what Eversource is currently doing in town with respect to its substation. And the gist of it is that each of these substations, the areas where fluids are stored or used, will be in kind of a, the best way to describe it, a giant bathtub, um, separating uh, the the facility from any from reaching the ground, there will be a, 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 a kind of a tub that directs the any fluids that would escape into a, a basin. They'll be monitored. They'll be collected before they can enter the groundwater. Um, and the town's en town engineer uh, or the independent engineer is basically the one who insisted upon this, and we agreed to it. It's in writing in our uh, host community agreement for. Both of those projects, it would be if we have a host community agreement for this one, it will be uh, in that host community agreement. And our design document that we submitted to the Energy Facility Siting Board also includes that design. So the way we're going to protect groundwater is with a belt and suspenders approach uh, that prevents those fluids from ever getting into the ground and therefore into the groundwater. And I wonder before Ken goes, just to add to that briefly, Susie, is just 
folks might have read, if you read the town's ENF comment letter, you know, I defer to the town to, to confirm this, um, but the town did address these issues quite a bit in there. From our perspective, we see that as a town forecasting that same requirement that is done for the prior two substations in Independence Park and the Shoot Flying Hill, that the town is expecting the same setup and level of um, high level of groundwater protection of the dielectric fluids from the substation that we did in the prior two agreements. Um, and we see that consistent with um, forecasting that that will be, uh, the town is looking for that to be part of the host community agreement. And as Ken indicated, we're already planning that, um, that that'll be the case. Well, thank I'm, you so much. I yeah. just wanted to add that uh, my friend, Ann Rowland, who I've known for years, mm -hmm. spoke at your the Centerville meeting last week. Yeah. She, and you promised Ken that that would never, that we've never had a, a, a breach in the aquifer, yeah. our precious drinking water. You did say, I did. Guarantee I stand by it. I, that, that design, and you know, don't take my word for it. Take the town's independent engineer's word for it. Okay. So I just want Kenford Cheryl, Can you just talk about why we need the substations, and then, uh, ma'am, uh, you and, and, the, and then uh, Suzanne after that, and then we'll do some Zoom questions. Okay. The um, <clears throat> the three different projects have three different interconnection places within the grid. Um, uh, Vineyard Wind One is interconnecting to the Barnstable substation at the 115 level. Um, Park City Wing is connecting into West Barnesville 345, as as is uh, Commonwealth Wing interconnecting with 345. The the way the, the projects work is they have each each one has its its own dedicated interconnection point, and the power needs to be uh, stepped up or stepped down in voltage. In the case of Commonwealth Wind, power comes in from the sea at 275 kV. But it needs to interconnect with 345. So we have transformers that what we call step up the voltage from 275 kV to 345. In addition to that, the power is, in layman's terms is conditioned uh, to ensure that it's, it's operating in the correct operating regimes and frequencies and things of that nature to meld in with the grid. So since all the projects are, are basically treated as independent, that's why each one has, needs to have its own individual substation. Thanks, Kate. So uh, you, ma'am, and then Suzanne, and then we'll do Zoom and then back to the room. You yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I'm new to these meetings, so I'm just learning and trying to come up with my own opinion about what I think of all this. Mm -hmm. And you know, there's lots of concern from the residents because of the disruption mm -hmm. and you know what will it do to our beach and could it kill a whale? You know, well, lots of things that people are concerned about. What mm -hmm. what I was interested in is we talk about enormous benefits to the town, enormous financial mm -hmm. benefits. And from what I heard so far, there was some numbers put out there that were, say, 16 million over 25 years. Yep. And and I understand that there are other significant benefits to the town financially. Mm -hmm. And I wonder where can I get the information as to what are those enormous, 16 million to me sounds like nothing. Mm -hmm. um, and if it's to pay the parking lot or to build a new beach house, that seems maybe, maybe insignificant to the totality of the destruction to the town and destruction to our property values. God forbid something happens, you know, that all the businesses and the lost revenue and and I haven't heard, at least maybe I'm just not sure where, you know, where the guarantees are, like who's gonna pay when all this if if and maybe it never will happen, right? But what are those enormous benefits? So yeah. I was sitting in a government position like why would I want to do this other than to be a good corporate citizen to help the end. Okay, so it's three different projects. I'll do this quickly, but sort of talk about each and what's sort of known from Vineyard Wind and what's um, projected for Park City Wind and Commonwealth Wind. So you're right, for both Vineyard Wind and Park City Wind, there are very similar host community agreements that say for each of those two projects, it's $16 million just in mitigation payments over 25 years for each project. Um, and then separately, um, commercial tax revenue paid to the town of Barnstable. In the host community agreements, there's a formula that sets how much money um, will be paid each year. Um, but after that 25 year period, it'll be at least 16 million um, in, in the mitigation payments and, and additional property taxes. That's to the town in, in those direct forms of payment. Then the indirect forms, then the indirect costs for the sewer partnerships um, for Vineyard Wind and what's planned for Park City Wind and potentially Commonwealth Wind is offsetting a good deal of the town's construction costs. So that includes things like the pre-construction survey of the relevant roads, engineering, some of the design, um, and the road resurfacing at the end. 
in the video that I referenced earlier and Bob Schulte referenced that town manager just put out on channel 18, he put that sort of indirect cost, I believe it's somewhere around $4 million was the number he did. I'm actively, to be honest with you, working with across our teams, trying to calculate those exact numbers was I wanna be more specific at future meetings um, and put that out to, to residents. Um, so he said, let, let's say that's maybe another $4 million of dollars of value of offset construction costs that if the town was doing the sewer project alone, they'd have to pay. Then there's the water district. For Vineyard Wind, they're replacing um, for their route section that's within the Com district, which is essentially from Cobles Beach to some point, I think, on Attics Lane. It's about 4,000 linear feet. Um, that is, as I've seen estimates of that around the three to $4 million range of value. Um, I'll have to check my notes from, from that from the Com water superintendent of value to the Com water district. Obviously, also you pay, you'll pay taxes to. Um, and then the substation for Vineyard Wind will pay taxes to the Barnstable Fire District for that property that's in their, uh, in their, in their territory in Precinct 1 in Barnstable. Then for Park City, again, 16 million plus, plus uh, commercial property taxes in town. We have the same plans of sewer partnership. Um, and I don't have figures yet, but at some point in the future, we'll have figures that we'll work on with the town of what those savings are, of what we're picking up that the town would otherwise have to do for that route. <laughs> Um, we will pay for the substation taxes to the West Barnstable Fire District, and we're actively talking, um, or we're going to, sorry, I should say, we're going to be actively talking in the near future to the Com Water District about um, agreements for the Park City Wind and Commonwealth Wind water main replacements for those routes. And we can anticipate that'll be in the millions of dollars of value of replacement that otherwise would be borne by Com Water District ratepayers. Um, and then for Commonwealth Wind, um, we'll pay our substations also in West Barnstable Fire District. Um, we're going to very likely do a good deal of water main replacement that will be in the millions. We don't, we haven't um, started um, the host community agreement negotiations. I think we, we may have one meeting and then the town manager has, has uh, elected to pause. Uh, we don't have a, a number set or we haven't uh, negotiated that yet. Um, so that'll be something in the future of what that mitigation, whether it's $16 million or or a different number, um, that'll be determined in the future. But that's what we're talking about in terms of direct uh, savings to you, particularly all of you in the room, um, of uh, in your calm water rates or to, to, your, to as, you know, as members of the calm water district and, um, and to you as taxpayers in the town. And I would submit, and we'll see if, you know, I'll, I'll be watching later tonight, uh, Mark Milne, the finance director for the town of Barnesville is gonna be talking about uh, the financing um, and future projections of funding for the town's comprehensive wastewater management plan that these partnerships with Vineyard Wind, Park City Wind, and Commonwealth Wind um, have the potential to be a significant, uh, not only accelerant um, and making possible the uh, financially the, the uh, sewer projects thus far, but particularly um, putting the town in a place where they haven't had to go to property taxes for an override and for property tax increases at this point yet to do the sewer projects thus far because of the funds they're getting from us and from uh, state and federal sources. So hopefully that answers your question. Yeah, um, Suzanne, and then I'm gonna do Zoom and then back to the other folks in the room. I just wanna follow up on Susie's comments about the aquifer. As you well know, the town of Barnstable responded to the ENF, mm -hmm. uh, they had two major concerns. One is that the causeway, the culvert that bisects the causeway will not be able to support the weight of the duct that you, you would plan to build. Um, and the, the uh, failure of the culvert could result in the catastrophic failure of the entire causeway. If you decide and EFSB decides that it's unwise to use the causeway, your second plan is to drill under HDD drill under East Bay. There are lots of, um, uh, well, I, I won't go into that too much. The town said in their response, this is, they were worried about the, you know, the well heads and the, the well fields and all, but I was very struck when they said that the depth and the angle of what you need to do to start the HDD process offshore, it's so deep that it could very well pierce the aquifer because they believe the aquifer stretches out under the seabed off of Delsus Beach shore. And that if you were to puncture that, the aquifer would be contaminated with ocean water. That's irreversible, okay? And now I'm not saying this, the town said that. Um, so, and by the way, 
drilling under East Bay, you're talking about coming up at the boat ramp, just so that folks in the room know, taking over a thousand feet of East Bay Road in both directions, as well as private property west of East Bay Road that abuts wetland, all right? So when we talk about the aquifer and the drinking water of this town, I want people to be well aware of what that town said, not Suzanne Conley or the other members of Greater Delsus Beach. Great question. So I don't know, Ken, you want to start? You want to talk about the culvert? Oh, culvert? Yeah. yeah. We're actually, uh, we had discussions with the town yesterday regarding the culvert, and we're going to continue those discussions and, and investigations. The, the duck bank and the cable that we would be, uh, that are conceptual design today, so going over the culvert actually doesn't add any weight to it. What will happen is there'll be a, a layer of gravel that exists now, a layer of pavement that will actually be taken out, the duck bank would be laid in. And our preliminary studies have determined that the weight is act, of the duck bank and cable is actually uh, equal to or less than what's there today. So it's really not adding any additional weight. Um, other elements of the, uh, the design, we are planning to meet with the town and, and have more granular discussions for it. Could you talk about the HDD offshore and what would happen if you puncture the aquifer? Okay, I'll be honest. I, I this is the first I'm hearing of any concern. It's in their response to the EMF. I'm sorry, I, mean, I just personally haven't seen it to answer the question. Uh, maybe we should. I Suzanne, we'll, we'll we'll investigate that back to you. I I haven't seen. I didn't. I missed that part of the EMF comment letter as well. I, I heard you say that uh, at the December OBA meeting. Um, but let us investigate that and get back to you in writing. Um. Because, or that if, if that's in the ENF comment letter for the town, then we will be addressing that through the MEPA process, as you know, anyways. Um, was that it, Susie? Or any other? Did we get every part of your question? Or do you? I guess, um, I don't know. The question is um, <laughs> why wouldn't you read the email? Wait, wait, hold, hold on. Oh, we, we have all read the town's MEPA yeah. comments very carefully. None of us are, and I, I'm saying this respectfully, none of us are recalling hearing the town say in the ENF comments that we're going to puncture yeah, the aquifer. I'm not, I'm not saying you're wrong. I'm not, believe me, I'm not disputing you. I don't, I don't recall that terminology. We're going to have to look at it and get back to you. So I'm not saying you're wrong or right. Of course, we've read this document. We take it really seriously. I think none of us, we're all drawing a little bit of a blank on that comment. We need to look at it and get back to you. Excuse me, Ken. I, I don't mean any disrespect either. But that's a really big deal for anybody that lives here. It, it is it a big is deal. Disappointing to think that three representatives of this big project miss that. Well, again, I think we're going to our town people. I think we're going to we're town look. I, I'm I'm telling you, we read that document extremely carefully. It's not ringing the bell to us, but I'm not saying you're wrong. If right. we missed it, we're going to look at it very very seriously. That's a really big. Thing. I understand that. Well, personally, I'll be reading it as soon as I get home. That's for sure. I will too. Time to say that. Oh, well, you know, yes. if I'm wrong, I would be the first to say oh, I'm yeah. wrong. Okay. But I'm well, sure. just, yeah. Yeah, no, let's, no, we're we're not disputing you right now. We're just simply saying we don't remember that going in there, and we will look at it. We did meet with the town to go over the MEPA comments, and I have to be honest, that wasn't talked about. <laughs> but we're going to look at this very yeah. seriously. Absolutely. So folks, please, I'm going to do a couple on Zoom and then we'll get to the other hands in the room. So Steve, um, I see questions in the Q&A and if there are folks who have raised hands, um, maybe we'll do, do two on Zoom and then um, we'll go back to the room. So do you have anybody, Steve? Yep, we got a couple okay. of Q&A questions here. Firstly, are we using AC or DC cables and what are the pros and cons of the one we chose? That's good. So I'll start in Ken and Aaron add. So we're using AC cables uh, for this project. Um, it's recommended for AC cable to be used for offshore route lengths of less than 50 miles. For Pamela Windor, I think we're at 41 miles of offshore. Um, so this is an AC cable project versus a DC cable project. The benefits of AC cable uh, primarily that I know is less power is lost along the route when you use AC cable for offshore wind. Less power dissipates along the, the route, um, and you get more of your power yield actually getting on shore if you use AC cable versus DC cable. I don't know of any other pros and cons of the two. I don't know if, if well, Ken or... The, the DC is actually more impactful because you need more infrastructure. The turbines out in the sea, they generate at AC. So in a DC project, the offshore stuff substation that actually have a component called a converter station. That's an extension of the substation. They would convert the, the power from AC to DC, run along the seafloor, 
hit the beach and then get routed. And what we now show as a substation would actually need to be expanded to have the converter, a converter attached to it, which is a fair amount of real estate, where again, that DC power coming from the sea would have to be converted to AC because it needs to interconnect with the grid at AC. So yeah. it's and Ken, I've heard in the past something around the, the offshore substation and onshore substation for a DC project needs to be about 33% bigger or sure. something in that exactly. so we'll a third bigger than an AC cable substation onshore or offshore. Next, Steve, we'll take one more and then we'll go back to the room and then come back to Zoom in a bit. Next up, what kinds of costs are necessary for the new substation and when is that expected to start? What kinds of costs? So subs, onshore construction is projected for Commonwealth Wind to start in the fall 2025. Substation construction, I think also sometime in 2025, Aaron, in that range. What kind of costs? It's the project, the components um, of the substation, the labor, that component in itself will be in the, the millions of dollars for the construction of that project. I'm not trying to, other costs, I can't think of, of how, what other costs would be involved the construction of substation, the, the cost of building the substation is part of the project budget. I wonder, is it possible the questioner means impacts, not costs? Yeah, do you, do you know, Steve, costs or do you mean impacts instead of costs? Potentially, the verb, the, the words were, were costs. Okay, well, hopefully that answers. If, if we didn't get uh, what the person was looking for, please put your question back into the chat and we'll get back to you. I think also, Pat, maybe to clarify, mm -hmm. who would be paying the cost of building the new substation we would be building for the project? Us. That's part of the project budget. Okay, sir. And then um, we'll go to you and then Mike, and then we'll go from there. Okay, sir. Uh, my name is Jim O'Leary, president of Bostonville. Mm -hmm. And um, I believe we have representatives of various political leaders mm -hmm. here, either virtually or in the room. And I was wondering if they could just identify themselves and share where their office stands on this project. Yeah, I was going to do that in my yeah. next comment. Mike Jackson from Partners from Keating's office. I'm joined on the Zoom by uh, Ben Thomas from Senator Markey's office and Caleb White from Senator Warren's office. Um, I'm appreciative of the opportunity to hear from the company and hear from folks in, in the room about um, you know the information about this project. I'm looking forward to being part of the uh, the Boehm, um, uh Zoom meetings coming up, and and I have questions myself, which I was hoping to ask in a few minutes, but uh, just trying to get some information at this point. Thanks, Jim. And just while we're on that, I know Councilor Cusack had to step out. I don't see any other folks. Caleb um, from Senator Warren's office, you're welcome to, to say something or any comments you'd like to provide on behalf of Senator Elizabeth Warren, if you'd like. Hello, everybody. Yes, thank you. As uh, Mike mentioned, my name is Caleb White. Uh, I am the regional, regional director for the South Coast Cape and Islands uh, for Senator Warren. Um, and we're kind of in the same camp right now, as uh, Mike mentioned, we're kind of just in a fact gathering situation right now, um, but more than welcome to have any comments sent our way. Um, and I'd be more than happy to speak with anybody over the phone or via email as well after meeting for anything additional. Thank you. And just to your question, Jim, I know that Representative Diggs is well aware of this uh, project and Senator Sear. I know that Representative Diggs attended the Safe Douses Beach meeting on Tuesday night. Um, and, uh, and Senator Sears will aware of it as well. So I think that, that get, hopefully answers your question. So who's, uh, who's with um, Markey's office? I don't think- Ben, it, ben Thomas. Oh, Ben, I'm sorry. But thank you so much, Hector. Ben uh -huh. Thomas from Senator Markey's office. I don't know if you'd like to say anything on behalf of, of Senator Ed Markey. If you're sorry, I did, I did see Ben on earlier, but it doesn't look like he's on now. Okay. He was on. Any other questions, Jim, or did that get well, thank you. Okay. Mike, would you like to say anything else? Uh, yeah, any questions? I just had a few questions yeah. um, kind of related to what Suzanne mentioned about the horizontal mm -hmm. directional drilling. My question was more about how much sand is actually displaced. And this could be something you've already covered in other meetings, but and is there any danger of undermining the dunes or any of the infrastructure on the beach? There's a, a, a real science to it. First of all, to answer your, your original question on the volume of sand removal, um, what ends up getting installed is a, a 36 diameter um, HDP, high density polyethylene sleeve, one for each of the three landings. Um, so that'll give you a rough idea. The, it's about, again, a, a bore of about 40 inches would be made to accommodate the, the, um, the sleeve. And the length is about a half a mile times three. 
Okay. Regarding uh, your question, and it's a good one about the um, uh, protecting the dunes. Is, is there risk of, of any any type of cave in? I guess is another way to ask your question. Um, there's, there's a real science to it, um, where it, the, the it's an optimization that needs to occur, where the engineering team uh, utilize the geotechnical data that we have. <laughs> And then they optimize on, on many different things, including the angle of attack and how quickly you dive underground. What, what you want to do, generally speaking, is to, is to drive into, into stable soil. And the consistency of the soil will dictate how deep you need to go and how quickly you need to get there. Uh, so there's a lot of science to it. In addition to that, a lot of it is construction technique. And it's monitored very carefully uh, to ensure that uh, the, the drilling company does not try to go too quickly. The way the drilling occurs is that there's a drill bit. Sure, that's the easy part. But there's also a drilling fluid that keeps the bit warm and, and, and allows the, uh, the, the, the spoils, the fines that get drilled out uh, to, to uh, be flushed out of, out of the hole. Uh, there's a lot of technique that the uh, Grid will be very carefully monitoring during construction to ensure that uh, that, it, that, that is proceeding in a, in a safe manner to ensure that there's no no kind of cave-in or any kind of detriment. <clears throat> My other question is for you as well. Uh, the study you talked about that you were part of for the magnetic fields and the electromagnetic fields, yes, sir. is there a way to access that? And part two of that is, are there other independent studies uh, either done by the federal government or, or other independent bodies that have looked at the same issue and come to either similar or different conclusions? Okay, I'll answer the first half and maybe one of you guys, Aaron, can answer the second half. The project is just now com completing uh, the, the magnetic field study. That was a very close calibration uh, between the, um, the, the modeling, the study company that did the work, a company called Grady and Stantec on the engineering side. And we were, worked very closely with them to optimize and to reduce the magnetic fields to, to get them to you know, very, very, very low levels. That report just got issued today, and it's going to be part of one of the next filings that uh, that Alvin could be making. Some questions. Yeah, sure. Um, so we're anticipating filing that with CFSB in February. Um, so that will be available on on the DPU docket as well as on our website. And and who did the study? Um, gradient or gradient. Gradient. It's a yeah, it's a sub consultant who specialized in Vienna. And, and you know, I, I, I think it's a legitimate concern. It's a new, fairly new industry here in our country, but obviously it's been mm -hmm. has a little bit of a legacy in Europe. Had there been other studies about uh, these onshore cables and what the impact would be? Yeah, so so offshore wind's a newer industry, but you know, transmission isn't. We right. have that all over the country and. Um, there are studies that the report references to any potential impacts on, you know, marine life for the subsea cable, as well as, you know, any health and safety guidelines that are out there. Like I said, there are some international guidelines and any of the levels that have been reported for our project are well below those. Have any studies, including this one, looked at currents of this magnitude? Yes, yes. Aaron brings up a good point. <clears throat> sure, these are the first large scale offshore wind uh, projects in the US. It's been done in Europe. But underground electri electrical transmission has been around in the US for a long time. Okay. Um, so, so hands again, I, sorry, sorry, you with the, uh, the sorry, right there. Thank you. Take care, everybody. I was going to describe your hair, but <laughs> I have a few questions on economics. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you know, when, when the governor decided to let all the wind companies uh, put their own cables in, I think that was a huge mistake. I think the coast is going to turn into an electrified hole again. When we, is, my question is economically, is it more sensible to make a single cable going right into the major cities where the power is eventually going to end up anyway? Instead of going through these little towns, building all these substations, we're going to have to build a brand new grid from Cape Cod to Boston, and nobody will tell me who's going to pay for that. So that's going to be very expensive. That's another part of the project that needs to be included. And so does it make more sense to do a single cable than a bowl of spaghetti? That's a great question, sir. And so I'll do my best to answer it. There's a lot of levels to that. 
So the first component is, is that really is a decision for the state of Massachusetts, at least for um, its procurements and that it's putting out um, and its permitting processes uh, to determine if they'd wanna do that. So there, there, you, what you're talking about is there's two different approaches. And I think on Tuesday night, the Save Dowsers Beach um, folks presented on this. The Osceola Village Association has this uh, study on the website from a group called Embaric. So there's a lot of conversation about a planned approach versus a generator lead line right. individual project with their own offshore export cable projects. Thus far in Massachusetts and other states um, in the New England area, and I, I believe there may be one state, maybe New Jersey, that was exploring a, 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 a shared approach or a planned approach. I don't recall the details on that, but for the most part, the procurements, the projects authorized so far that are being constructed or in the permitting process have their individual generator lead line cable approaches, okay? So the, that has been the approach so far. For many years, there has been debate on Beacon Hill in the legislature. And I, I used to work in the legislature for Senator Sears, so I, I um, encountered some of this. And um, there, especially in Barrick and a couple of other companies have been pushing for the state and the legislature to create a separate procurement process for a company like in Barrick or, or others who do this to create a shared transmission system to plug into a couple of locations in Massachusetts that all offshore wind projects in the area south of the islands would plug into and that that would be done that way. Thus far, the legislature has not done that. They, they've only done the procurements that we've been into, including the ones for Vineyard Wind and, and Commonwealth Wind, where it's the responsibility of us, the offshore wind company, to find our own landing location and find our own sub substation, onshore route, all of that on our own. And that's That's been their decision. The legislature in, in July of 2022, they, they passed a bill called the Driving Clean Energy Forward Bill, where they created a, off, a transmission working group for offshore wind that I believe is looking on onshore transmission, substation availability, um, offshore transmission, the possibility of shared transmission pyramids in the future um, that I believe is still active. And that was, that was authorized last summer um, and uh, may, may be still going under the new Healy administration. Um, so so that, that is out there, but it would really be up to the state and the legislature to create such a system and require offshore wind offer developer to use it. Thus far, that's not the route they've taken. In terms of costs or benefits, that's really, I imagine something that that group is gonna look at. There have been different studies and projections of comparing costs um, I will say, you know, the thing I've thought of in reading in Barrick's report, and you know, that is, I think, is consideration is how much of the land acquisition costs um, and other um, other costs of realizing those um, land locations and and interconnection you know, locations and um, getting Q position. How much of that is um, not factored into projections in in some of those studies? I'm not sure, um, but that would be an interesting question to look at. Hopefully, this group is looking at that. But that's the context of. It's not like we would have to build this system. Right. It would have to be done separately by standard. Yeah. Uh, the five New England states that did a uh, study a few months ago mm -hmm. uh, who were looking at a single cable approach. Uh, has, has, have we heard anything from that study yet? I haven't. I don't know if anybody... I haven't. What a shame. So my answer to my question is it more efficient to have a single cable and and not have to rebuild the entire grid from Cape Cod to Boston or Cape Cod to Providence or Cape Cod to Connecticut. I think it's I think it's a tough question to answer, Ken. I don't know if you want to I mean I think whether it's done with a shared cable or multiple cables, I mean one of the unfortunate things is our grid is not up to speed to handle this transition. So well for whatever, yeah, I mean that that's a good point. For whatever reason, you know, we're trying to make this transition to clean energy as quickly as we can, and what we're coming up and, against uh, economically, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, economy. no, absolutely. What we're coming up and against is well, my question is, I just would want to know which approach do you think is more economically sound? I, I don't actually know, but, but the, the point I wanted to make was the what project, but the, so the, many unknown here. All right, let, let me speak for a minute. All right. the, the only point I wanted to make is whether it's a shared transmission line out in the ocean or whether it's multiple different ones mm -hmm. there's going to be significant cost to upgrade the grid so that it can accommodate 
all the megawatts that are coming in. And, and that's going to have to be paid for one way or the other. So I don't that's think- That's why we want to bring it to the major city so we don't have to carry it. Well, it, the, grid, the, the grid as a whole is going to have to get upgraded to accommodate these sources of energy. And that is something that rate payers at large are going to pay for. But I, I do want to point this out. This is really important. What's really killing us on our electric bills right now is natural gas prices and the dramatic spike that we've experienced in part because of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Well, but wait, hold on, hold on. What, what's happening, what, hold on, what's happening now? Wait, wait. So when you see Eversource or Grid talk about $100 a month increases in electricity rates for the average rate payer, yeah. the main culprit of that is we are dependent upon one fuel source. And, and part of what this, Wind offshore wind energy offers is an alternative, is a diversification, is a lowering of our costs because we have other at other supplies and we're not dependent upon one fuel. So that also needs to be thrown into the mix. And that's why ultimately over time, even with the grid modernization, diversifying is a good deal for ratepayers and a good deal for consumers. And it will make us independent and it will make us economically better off. But I don't have an answer to your question because I haven't seen the studies that have really compared those things in an apples to orange, so apples to apples way. Well, we know what the state directed us to do. Just um, in primary, I think I'm recognizing, Michael, is that you back there? Yeah. Uh, so this is Michael Holcomb, who's district director for Senator Sear. So I know we, we uh, Michael, earlier, um, Jim O'Leary asked for folks who are representing elected officials to speak. I don't know if you want to say anything on behalf of Senator Sear. Who's, your state senator. Just here to listen to the informed discussion and hear what the neighbors have to say, and obviously the representation from Ottenberg is here to answer uh, your question. Thank you so much, Michael. We appreciate that. So I see you, sir, and then we'll go to some other <laughs> man. Right there. Just, <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, oh, I'm so sorry. Okay, I'm hiding behind this gentleman. I'm so sorry, that's and we'll go to you, you, and then you, sir. Thank you. I'm Doug Childs. I'm born in Cape Cod Hospital. I work in the uh, uh, Gulf of Mexico. In the energy field, it's a merchant mariner, U.S. flag. Why are you using so many foreign flagged vessels, and uh, how how does that not violate the Jones Act? You might. I think you're the only one for that. It's a tough question. Well, first of all, we're going to comply with the Jones Act. We have to comply with the Jones Act. You fooled the was a foreign flagged uh, company. The the Jones Act. I, I am not an expert in it, but what what I what I generally understand is this. First of all. And this is another piece of the infrastructure that we don't really have in place in this country. But we're already working. Okay. <clears throat> the, okay, go ahead. The work the work we're doing in Vineyard Wind is in compliance with the Jones Act. But yeah. Go ahead. So cable laying was actually excluded from the Jones Act yeah. when it was enacted in like 1910 because um, the United States wanted a cable from Britain. <laughs> but but the so that's why the, yeah. yeah that's why yeah. just cable laying is excluded. So that's the only vessel that's private. But all, all, all the offshore work will be done in all the offshore and onshore work will be done in compliance with the Jones Act. Um, we have to follow it. There's different ways of complying with the Jones Act, um, but this does highlight another missing piece of the infrastructure here. There, there is one big jack-up vessel um, being built in the United States right now to uh, provide vessel capacity for an entire industry. So we're behind. And one other question, what is the plan moving forward with a dielectric fluid to protect the aquafilter with the bathtub, so to speak, that it was described as? Sure. Where would we dispose of this product? Okay, <laughs> good question. So some of the uh, electrical equipment in the substation contains dielectric fluid. It's like a mineral oil. And Ken or, or Pat was right explaining what the criteria were to, to be a little bit more specific. The way it's designed is, is based on the sum of two numbers. One number is the 110% of the volume of the, of the dielectric fluid in a container. So for example, if a transformer has 100 gallons, I'm not saying 100 gallons, I don't know what it is, but if we would design for 110 gallons as one component. The second component in the bathtub that Ken had described is 30 inches of rainwater. So it's 30 inches of rainwater in addition to 110% um, of the dielectric, the mineral water volume. So that's the way it's set up. 
the these bathtubs will be fitted with a drain pipe. And the drain pipe is going to have a device called an, an, a miter piece in it. And we did a demo for the town of Barnesville Vineyard One One. And the way the way these are miter piece work, it's in a canister, and water will flow right through it. These miter piece are some type of polymer, some sort. And what happens is the way they're they're constructed is is that water just passes right through it. But as soon as they uh, are exposed to any kind of oil, any kind of hydrocarbon, they actually solidify and, and, and form a plug for, uh, for, I think it was for Mr. McLaughlin, the town attorney. We did a demo in the town hall several, several years ago showing that concept. So that's, that's, the, that's the level, level of defense. Um, in addition to that, the drain piping will be fitted with valves. So heaven forbid, forbid if there was any kind of event, what would happen is the minute, the um, second, that the Amigra Beat sea oil will plug up and basically contain the dielectric fluid, and then it just sits there. And then what would Alvin Good would then need to do, and they, they do uh, very frequent uh, daily surveillance of, of the substation, they would then go in and physically pump out that bathtub and remove the dielectric fluid, replace the Amigra beads, and, and get back. Where, to where's the it. disposal plan? Where would that go? Uh, there, there are um, uh, sites that are, are specifically set up for the disposal of materials. Forgive me, I don't know if they are. It's like uh, within town, they tell you where you could dump your batteries or CRT screens. There, there's a process that's uh, advocated by the state that I'm um, good, of course, would follow. Which so, may not be in the town, right? We don't know where. It would... I, I don't know where it yeah. is. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. Probably is not, not within the town. But does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, okay thank, thank you, sir. So, ma'am, are you there? And then uh, Philly sat, and then we'll go back to Zoom for that. <laughs> Two things, and this is my first meeting that I've come to. Number one, I don't think you're emphasizing the positiveness or the, the reason why we're looking at clean energy. Okay. I and mean, I think that's something that I know everybody's very upset about. It's, it's going to be a disruption. You're going down out to the left side of road, right past uh, a business property that I'm part of, and, and another property. I'm not sure. So I get it. It's going to be, it's going to be disruptive. But I think in the long term, is in this country, you talk about the infrastructure, it's not up to them to fix it. And they're not going to deal with the infrastructure for this whole, for the state or the country. This country is behind. We, we, just, neglect, we just neglect it. So I look at it and I say, okay, is there, what is the positive aspect for doing this? Yes, it's going to provide more power. I, talk about electric, electric bill and gas bill. It's ridiculous. My question is when you show that, um, when you show the cables being laid, and, and I know everyone's concerned about the electromagnetic field, is that any worse than I'm looking at the cables coming down through Cape Cod, mm -hmm. or all the cables that are, that are is that going to be any worse? I mean, living next to that underground cable with you know, your underground trench with three cables, is that any worse than the people who live along? The cable, the cable. Yeah. Well, I think you, thank you, man. So thank you so much for your comments. We really appreciate that. And I think, are you talking about power lines, above ground power lines? Yeah. I would say, I don't know if, I don't know if Aaron or Ken can, I, I've seen studies that, that buried uh, infrastructure is far better than above ground infrastructure, particularly those higher tension transmission lines and, uh, in, the, in those power so lines. With, um, above ground transmission lines, um, there are electro and magnetic fields. With below ground transmission lines, there's just magnetic fields. Um, and so, you know, we take measurements of the, of the magnetic fields, right? Like maybe like a few feet above the actual cable. Um, and so that's what will re it's reported in our report. But then as you move away from the cable, it dissipates very, the magnetic field dissipates very quickly. So just to begin with, they're very low. And then as, as you know, you move away from the, the transmission line, they dissipate rapidly. Is it the same amount of megawatts though? The power cables versus the well, Yes. Yeah. Wait, I want to turn it on. Uh, I mean, so different. it is very, um, but what, no, one of the reasons we're, Connecting to the West Barnesville substation is because it's connected to 345 kV transmission cable. We so I don't know much about electricity at all, but can you say um, the above ground power lines that we see, what energy is traveling through them comparative 
to the 1200 megawatts you want to put into Osterville? Is it 30? Is it 100? So that's the concern. Is so the 1200 is huge. Yeah, the and much more than we need. The I measurements mean, of the know. you know the cables are in kilovolts. So um, can you convert that into to megawatts? How does that work, Ken? Which you want to? It sounds like I want to just get this question because I think we'll need to respond to it. And you want a comparison between the megawatts going or the, the amount of electricity going through the overhead cables, the big transmission right. lines on a big cross, versus what we're putting through. Twelve well, hundred megawatts. Yeah, right. so we'll we'll provide that calculation. Yeah, you can say and, that. and the wires up and down a residential street. Um, yeah, that's, well, okay, I those look, are two different things, but we can we can try to give you information about both. Well, and so you know what, what I'm saying is that the on land power cables that most everyone says we shouldn't live under, and I think there have been studies done that it's very damaging to people's health when they live under those. It's been a study going on. Well, right, okay, so they've been tied to the Yeah, they've been tied to glioma, which is a type of cancer. So. The ones that are up above, are they say 35 megawatts? Because that's one of the questions, Patrick, that I wanted to ask. Yeah. The ones coming from Marcus Vineyard and or between Marcus Vineyard and wherever, they're 35 and 36 megawatts. What you guys want to do is 1200. Like that, but I mean it's a scale yeah. that I mean we don't know anything about power. So so yeah, so, so that's what I was gonna say. We'll get back to you on the amount of current. Flowing through a comparison. Okay. Yeah, we will, and, and that's fair. It's totally okay. fine. I do want to point out though that um, if you're talking about things like electromagnetic fields, it really is critical to note that the voltage that we're talking about is underground in case yeah. right. versus right. overhead power lines. But we'll give, we'll give you the electricity, the amount of electricity flow, just so you have right. that a number. comparison. But the question I want to ask earlier, it's a different health issue though. Is what right. I'm saying. But why is why are these cables with this this project, why is it 1200 megawatts when the other ones are 35, 34 and 36 or 35, whatever? Like, why does it have to be so big? Sure. So, so those, I think you're referring to the power lines. Between yeah. Marcus and, yeah. yeah. So, that those are power lines that the utilities are supplying to give electricity to Martha's Vineyard and Nantucket. Mm -hmm. Those are relatively, as you know, low population areas. And I assume that those are sized and the amount of megawatts that are going through. Are intended to be enough to serve those communities. Th this 1200 is because the Commonwealth, to its credit, is trying to lower dramatically its carbon footprint and it wants to take advantage of the economy of scale that comes from building large scale offshore wind that will supply when we're when we're done and others 50% or more of the of the state's okay. electricity. But not at Cape Cod. No, that's, that's what people have to understand, right? Well, wait, wait. It, will, it will. No, no, no. Hold on. But from a previous meeting, Ken, you said, you said, this is what, and, and people that were in that meeting, correct me if I was wrong, but you said, you stood in front of us and said, we know that electricity electrons take the path of least resistance. Right. So even though Cape Cod isn't directed to get this power, you will get some of it. That is definitely true. And that was a quote. That, 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 that's and, correct. Or you guys were here, but so we're not getting the like. There are a couple of things: the sewer project and getting help for the sewer project. That's a big deal. But I think a lot of people think that all the sewer pipes that are going to be laid in the town of Arnsville are going to be paid by this project when in fact it's only a six for us it's only a six mile path where we're going to take advantage I mean we're, I'm talking about this project not the ones in Somerville that's well there's you have a couple questions here so let me do each one okay. systematically so first of all the reason why the project is so big is because the commonwealth wants to buy a lot of clean energy and it wants to take advantage of economies of scale to drive down the cost so that sure. that's the answer to that they picked 1200 Not in, in the bid. We bid 1200 in. I think we bid smaller versions too, and the Commonwealth wanted 1200. So that's that's that question. Can we confirm that with the Commonwealth too? I, I mean, I just yeah. yeah I, I mean, I think that. sure, sure. I, 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 there's no doubt they awarded us a 1200 megawatt contract. Oh, so yeah. I get that. That's why it's that side. Now, on the sewer, that's six miles that we're talking about, and you know, um. We have someone here who's an expert on it, is a very critical 
six miles. That's where a lot of the loadings that go to the three bays estuary come from. So I wouldn't minimize the water quality benefit of suing that. That's an enormous water quality benefit, and it's going to be some of the most costly construction for the town. So right. having and us do the design, the engineering, that's going to be big savings. Right. But people are, I think there's a, a lot of people in the general population that think the sewer project is going to be completely funded by this wind. Not completely. Incorrectly. Can I make a couple of comments? So, so uh, I'm Zena Sprocker with the Barnstable Clean Water Coalition. I've met some of you before. I haven't met everybody. We published a document, which you're all very welcome to. I don't have enough to give everybody today, but I'm happy to have you stop down the street, 864 Main Street. We're there all the time. There's a lot of information in here. Um, I'm a champion of clean water, the aquifer, and I believe this project may help, but I am not just a, a wind farm cheerleader. I have a lot of questions. We have a lot of questions, including safety. I think that's absolutely critical. Mm -hmm. Another gentleman who stepped away apparently has a good uh, a point, which is yeah. what's going to happen with high water. I mean, on December 23rd, I went down uh, to Dowson Beach. You couldn't get to Dowson Beach. Right? Dowson Beach was essentially underwater. In my mind, the bigger risk to Dowson Beach is climate change and sea level rise yeah. and not this project. In fact, that's one of the reasons I'm so supportive is because I actually believe that, unfortunately, human beings cause climate change. Not everybody believes that. Maybe it's cyclical. I believe it's people. And I believe we need to buy the insurance policy of clean energy in order to ensure that eventually there is a Cape Cod. Because you know what? The way sea level is going, there may not be in 500 years. Clean water is an important feature, and I want to address uh, the lady here who brought up the aquifer. The aquifer is actually not like a balloon that you pop, okay? And I think that uh, Avangrid and others could engage the U.S. Geological Survey, the smartest people in the room, in the world, in the United States, on the aquifer. They know more about it than anybody. I work very closely with them regarding clean water and the septic systems that are such a big problem for us. 85% of our pollution comes from septic systems. The scientists tell us that over 20, maybe 25 percent of the drinking water in the town of Yarmouth is, in fact, wastewater that went back into the aquifer. 20, 25 percent. It's going in that direction here. Why? Because we're all flushing our toilets. We're all putting stuff down the drain that goes back into the aquifer right here. Uh, the reason I'm particularly excited is that if we're able to do this and get 10 years of advanced work, the big if. Um, we did the math, and you're welcome to look at it in here. Uh, 10 years in the corridor that will go down Main Street would save us a billion gallons of wastewater going into the Three Bays estuary and going into the Sound. Uh, that's 1,560 Olympic sized pools of your wastewater and mine. It's a lot of wastewater. And you know what's really interesting is these days when we're testing the water, and we test the water around here, it's not only your urine, it's also uh, elevated levels of antibiotics and antidepressants. These are all the things that are in the water now. You know, the PFAS is a huge problem, uh, but water contamination is a problem for all of us and our children. I want to I wanna give a shout out to Susan and yeah. her group because I'm really pleased to see civic discourse where people aren't just shouting people down and talking over answers to questions. I think that uh, this group is trying to answer questions and it may not be perfect. We need more answers. And, you know, I've listed in, uh, in the newsletter that I put out, you know, what upgrades can we expect in the town of Oscar? What are we going to get exactly? What is going to be able to be negotiated? I'm not convinced that, that we uh, had the best deal for the other one. I'm not convinced of that. Uh, what construction mitigation can uh, and should we expect? I think that's critical. And especially safety and health. I think these are real issues. My office is uh, only a few uh, feet from uh, where uh, the cable might go if it actually goes there. I don't actually want to put something in that compromises my health. I can tell you that. So I think I think the health issues are really, really a good question. Um, and there should be answers to that question. And there should be information that's available in Europe and elsewhere 
um, and reasonable studies that we can do to understand that. Uh, but I think that, uh, you know, with all due respect to people who don't want to see this happen, um, there are people like the lady here who think that it may be a good thing. Uh, I count uh, myself and my organization in that camp, but it's a qualified support. There are answers to questions that we need to get. It is the first major project of this kind uh, in the United States. So we need answers to questions, but uh, I, I hope that the answer just isn't no. Uh, is let's get the answers to the question do the best we can because we may get clean water a lot sooner and we may actually help uh, the world and the planet because uh, clean air is kind of a critical thing and uh, sea level rise is definitely happening and if you don't think things are changing I grew up here spent my entire life here this is not the winter I remember okay <laughs> I don't remember 50 60 degree days in December and January is ever like that so things are changing, whatever you think the, the reason is. So thank you. Well said. Thank, thank, thank you so you. much. Sir, thank, thank you. you. Yeah, thank, thank you for patience. Okay. Yes, um, are the, the um, host community agreements, are they on the Barnesville website? So for, where can for, I get a copy of the host? And how different sure. is each of the three? You've got three different names for these projects, three different negotiations. I don't know how different each agreement is, Yep. but... How can we see this? So on vineyardwind.com slash Barnstable, you can read the full Vineyard Wind host community agreement. Okay. On parkcitywind.com slash Barnstable, um, you, there is the full, uh, and recently um, a minor update was made um, this past fall. That is that is on parkcitywind.com slash Barnstable. And I should give a shout out. I don't think she's here, but Heather Hunt um, back in September at the OVA meeting asked us to do that. So thank you to Heather for, for that reminder. Um, and so... Those are where those two are. Um, Commonwealth Wind, uh, we don't have a signed host community agreement. That negotiation is paused, so there's no document to you. And, and, and how have they evolved? Because they've been done on several years apart here, right? Ten humans. And 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 are these? And you have a separate LLC for each of these projects? Yes. Yeah. Right. Okay. Then I have one more follow up. But then go ahead. Do you want how are they different? It? Yeah, I'm curious to know as as time come on, you know more, you count yeah. those more. I'm curious to know, without me reading each of them separately next yeah. to each other, how they've evolved. So I, I did come to the company after the Vineyard Win one, so I've read it to familiarize myself. I, I can't say I've line by line compared it to the Park City one, which I was involved in. I do think the Park City one has more specificity about some of the responsibilities that we sort of took on for Vineyard Win, like the water um, stuff and, and our duty to restore roads, which... We ended up doing, but it wasn't quite in writing in the first host community agreement. I think the second one is more explicit. And my impression is there's things that uh, the town is gonna look for in the third one to have even more specificity and clarity on what our obligations are. Okay, my second question, and maybe this is more of a question for the state, is you talked about the, the cost of improving the, the grid, which may outweigh the the, the, the cost saving when I came to your earlier say by the way thank you for hosting these sessions um you had actually talked about possible cost savings and things you're projecting but are the, are the savings going to be overwhelmed by the cost of the grid and again that sounds like a sustained decision right and also how much will Barnesville itself benefit from these savings versus the state wanting this power to go elsewhere right so the Department of Public Utilities, which approved these the, the contracts for Vineyard Wind and Park City One, did a whole economic analysis and made factual findings and looked at the cost of upgrading the grid and still determined that both projects were a substantial net savings for ratepayers. And it's kind of for the reason we talked about right. natural gas prices are going like this. Right. Uh, these wind prices are a fixed contract. Uh, that, that's how they're that's how they're going. Uh, now I'm sorry, I lost track of the second part. Of this powers the state. Is, oh. You know how much is this state is going to allow Barnstable to benefit versus the rest of the state? Or yeah, so this is where the the, the contract the, the electricity flows in the, in its preferential pathways, and it turns out, and I've heard this from our own electric expert, 
that whether the contract is with Connecticut or with the state, the most of the power is actually going to be consumed by Cape Cod and Boston because the way the grid's set up, that's where it's going to go. Um, so you, to the extent you have pride in having clean energy powering your home, you're going to have a lot of clean energy power in your home. Um, in a, in a in a factual sense, you're going to have that. Um, and, and that's essentially the, the way it'll work. You will also have ratepayer savings just as everyone else is gonna have ratepayer savings because the cost of this wind power is lower than the alternatives. Thank you, Thank you so much, sir. So before we go to more questions, I wanna re re recognize your state representative, Kip Diggs, and uh, to, to our great delight, and uh, especially I know to Jim O'Leary, we have a, your full representation. We have Senator Sierra representative, we have Representative Diggs, we have Mike from Congressman Keating's office, and we have Caleb and Ben from Senator Warren and Senator Markey's office. So you're all of your, and Town Councilor Cusack was here earlier. Mm -hmm. So all of your elected representatives have been here tonight. Um, rep, uh, the, the others just said a few words. I don't know if you wanted to say anything um, briefly, just or, or any thoughts you'd like to share. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm interested. I mean, I'm listening to both sides um, and I'm respecting both sides. And I want to come up with a common sense thing. That if it's going to help us, then I want to do it. Not going to help it, and I don't want to. Um, I know there's a lot of concerns. Um, Suzanne put a great show on on Monday um, that brought a lot of questions. So you know what I would like to kind of do is kind of put apples to apples, and let's find out which one is true, negative, whatever, and see which way we can do this. So that again, one thing that is for sure, I've been here uh, um, for a long time. Not that long as some, some of you, but I walk, uh, live in Old Mill Road, and I walk uh, to Joshua's Pond, go to go swimming, and I used to see lady slippers all the time. We haven't pulled the lady slippers out, but the lady slippers are not growing. I used to get grapes, I used to get blueberries, I used to get raspberries. All those things, the, the bushes are there, but no fruit's coming out. So that's not because of, it's because of something. So I want to know why, okay? And I'm thinking it's because of the, our environment. Is, so Mother Nature is talking to us. And we've ignored that for a long time. We haven't talked about the ladies' supper. We haven't talked about this. We have, but now, you know, everyone's coming because of COVID, everything. Everyone has moved this way. And that's fine. But now we've never had infrastructure on Cape Cod ever. Now we have kind of a big dig going on on the Cape Cod because, whoa, we see, we see the decisions. But PFAS is going on. I mean, you know, PFAS is huge and is, you know, nonstick this, nonstick that. <laughs> Look, it well, plastic bottles. I mean, that's cancerous stuff. That's PFAS. Mm -hmm. So we, you know, our government, our, our people were making money, but we have to figure out ways to make money that's not going to jeopardize our children so that they can have a chance to live here. You know, we want to give them an opportunity, but we also want to be able to live free in a, in, a, in a way and be able to go to beaches, but I also want to, mm -hmm. I would love to, if I can do something to help green energy, let's, let's go. We, we can't, we can't keep waiting because I want to see our environment is talking to us. So um, mm -hmm. I'm here with you guys. I'm here for us because we have to be a team and work together. Thank so, you so much, Rep. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to take a couple of Zoom folks, uh, a few more, and then we'll go back to the room. So Steve, um, I see we have eight questions in, in the chat. And I don't know if there's anyone who wants to be unmuted, but please go ahead with the view. Ben Thomas from Senator Markey's office is back online. If you'd like to say a few words. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much uh, for the presentation tonight and for answering the community's questions. Um, I'm the Senator's Regional Director for the 9th Congressional District and so grateful for uh, Representative Diggs' comments there. Um, we are happy to be uh, supportive of the community's um, engagement here and appreciate uh, all the efforts to answer the questions um, and um, provide information about what will happen. Uh, but thank you again for the opportunity to join tonight and uh, see you all soon. Thank you, Ben. Great. Now we have a question from Frank. I'll allow you to talk and if you could unmute yourself and ask your question. Yeah, I'd like to know if uh, there are any health studies in the United States for these type of high voltage buried cables through residential neighborhoods. 
Erin, yeah. and can you come close here so that Frank can hear you? Thank yeah, you. sure. Yeah, so yeah, like I said, you know, there are transmission cables in the United States. Um, and the EMF report does reference, you know, health and safety guidelines for EMF. Um, I think, you know, there are there are studies in there that are referenced and um, happy to share that with everyone when it's when it's um, submitted to the EFSC. The uh, can, I, can I ask one quick addition to Please. that? The uh, output of the Pilgrim nuclear power plant is 680 megawatts. The cables that are going to go through these residential streets are 800 megawatts each. Now, how can you compare, compare, does anyone want a cable that large through their neighborhood? Yeah. Well, just, just to be clear, Frank, um, it's 400 megawatts per cable offshore, uh, but then the cables are uh, interchanged uh, proposed to be th that that would be done under the beach parking lot and a couple of vaults uh, under the pavement in the Dawson's Beach parking lot, and then there'll be uh, there'll be nine total onshore cables. I, I believe nine, right? Uh, th three. So it's it's not three uh, 400 megawatt cables under the road. There'll be a duct bank with nine um, uh, onshore cables in a cement duct bank um, with with some thermal uh, concrete thermal fill uh, as well um, and uh, that will be that will be under your road. So a total of a duct bank with approximately twelve hundred megawatts of power, um, not which, necessarily, yeah. which is double, which is double the output of the, the Pilgrim nuclear power plant. All right, and I, so obviously we have a lot of interest in this issue, the health um, impacts of this, uh, similar studies. Clearly, we have a consensus here from the community tonight for more information on this topic. So we, as Aaron said, we're going to be filing relevant studies to our energy facilities siting board um, filing, Aaron said in, in February. Um, once those are available, um, we will share those. And, and I'd imagine um, we will we'll likely uh, try to prepare for our February 23rd meeting back here at the Austria Library to include some of that information um, and, uh, and, and, and have more information to, to address um, since several folks have asked that question tonight. Yeah, and I understand the you know, question, you know, so put it into, perspective how we can compare certain size um, transmission lines but um, also important to remember that you know there's magnetic fields in household appliances like a hair dryer has like a 300 milligauss magnetic field when you use it um, your dishwasher has magnetic field magnets on your refrigerator have magnetic fields um, <clears throat> so you know they're all around us and it's you know there's a there are these guidelines and there is, you know, I think 2000 and, and that's with a margin of safety. And like I said, any of the magnetic fields associated with this project are well, well below that. Um, and, you know, one of the things that the siting board looks at is that we're, we're minimizing that magnetic fields to the maximum extent possible. Like that's something that, you know, they'll press us on and ask us and that we'll have to have to prove out during that review process. So it, it will definitely be, you know, just the beginning of, of looking at this. Thank you so much, Frank. Maybe one more on Zoom, and then I, we have a lot of hands still in the room here. Okay. Um, next question here. You said the uh, the cable lane company has experience doing this work. Who are they, and where have they installed before? Also, is there a monitor on board to make sure they drill at the agreed two parameters? Question. I'll start that and then go to Ken Fitzgerald. Cable laying offshore will primarily be done by Prismian. Um, we have selected Prismian uh, prior uh, to uh, to purchase the offshore cable that'll be beneath the seafloor. That is a company based in Italy. As part of the Commonwealth wind bid, um, we made an agreement with Prismian where we would give them a large contract of $900 million uh, for Park City Winds offshore cable and Commonwealth Winds cable. And as part of that, they agreed to construct a new manufacturing facility to make this offshore wind cable in Somerset, Massachusetts at the former Brayton Point coal plant site. Um, so that is um, where the cable will be purchased from. I believe Prismian, um, they do much of the cable installation themselves as, themselves as well um, as part of the agreement with their vessels. Um, and I know there are other uh, companies involved in that, but I don't know if I don't know if that's your, you can or, or others. I don't know about, I'm, I'm trying to think, onshore cable installation duct bank would be by Vinger Wind has been by Lawrence Lynch Corporation, it has, it has right? It's been by, by Lawrence Lynch. And uh, 
you know, we, we have spoken already about the experience on the offshore being um, from European related companies. The onshore work, specifically the Duck Bank, is a prime opportunity for local contractors. You are right. Um, the, it was Lawrence Lynch on Vineyard and won. They won that job through a competitive bid, bidding process. Um, what goes along with that, independent of, uh, of uh, Ivan Grid, is the uh, town work on the sore that would very likely also be another local contract. So, you know, it, it's really the, the onshore work that, that leads to the opportunities for the, not just the Massachusetts, but the local companies. In addition to that, the, the work in the substation, you know, the civil work that occurs there, there's uh, the foundation work. That's the bread and butter of many companies that are in, in southeastern Mass Massachusetts. So, a great, uh, great sources of lo local construction jobs uh, for this project. Yeah, thank you. And so, yes, there's there's lots of uh, experienced contractors. And for folks who don't know, Lawrence Lynch is headquartered in Falmouth. Um, we're at seven o'clock. We're going to keep going as we still have a lot of folks with questions. So, so ma'am, you right there. Or, uh, yes, please. <clears throat> Thank you. I'm Kathy Fulham Parcells. I started my CPA practice here in Osgoode back in 1989, and I've lived here for 38 years. So my biggest question is this one thing: is um, getting the information, running the numbers. It's got to make sense. Anytime anybody talks about talking to different people, groups, clients, you've got to understand the numbers. You've got to probe, and not probe, but you have to research. So you know that you understand the consequences and mitigate the risk. If there's a financial institution, banks, for instance, they have, uh, uh, you know, do stress tests. And stress tests is gauging it for different things in life. Important is to know if there's an adverse event, how is this going to impact the business? Because the numbers that are being reported are based upon some factor. We need to understand what are the parameters. What are the numbers? So if X, Y, Z happens, because this is going to impact the revenue that's coming to Barnes School. Mm -hmm. So I am doing this because I love the cake. I'm also doing this because I'm the taxpayer here. And it's going to make a difference on your taxes. And if there's a problem, a financial problem, we don't want to be having, you know, us paying for it. And there was the, this going back just to not to this, the block island, you know, the headline back in, 2020 is great peers on her proportion of the Block Island Wind Farm table mess. Now, I'm not even going to go into that, but I'm just saying we need to know. So, when we look back, you know that you did the very best you could based upon the circumstances. And I would say everybody in this room is interested in clean energy. Mm -hmm. We have to care about it. We do care about it. But we just want to make sure we've done our research mm -hmm. to make sure we get the best in. Mm -hmm. uh, outlook and result as possible. So when we look back, we say, we know we did the best on the circumstances. The one thing I'm just gonna bring up because I'm a numbers person and knowing that short time after the uh, agreement contract was done, you know, Avon Grid uh, said, you know, mm -hmm. making this project viable when you have to renegotiate. And, and Ken was, I believe you were comment, uh, quoted on this and this was with Commonwealth Magazine. He, he said, um, making this project viable would only require a very modest increase, which means to the budget. But then I guess I'm a little confused where there was another quote, I guess, with uh, Ken was saying that the sum that has been raised millions of, you know, that has been raised millions of dollars of cost to this project and the current contract price is insufficient to cover those costs. The project now is what's called a negative present value. <clears throat> so the thing is we're trying to equate just a modest increase and then you see something that, you know, wow. this comment, and I'm not gonna try to interpret it, but that would just say, we need to look into the numbers to make sure are we doing what's best and if there is a something that comes up that's unexpected, the revenue, if it's you know a negative one, the revenue is going to be decreased to what's going to the town. And we just want to know who's responsible, even though it's a limited liability company. But we've seen in the past that limited liabilities can have an issue where, and if they have to, I'm not saying this is going to happen, but there is the possibility if there's a problem with a bankruptcy. 
who's left having to pay the expenses. And I think another thing which I would like to hear is the maintenance of whether the cables every 25 years, after 25 or 30 years or 50 years, who is responsible for maintaining them? Because if the federal government says we need to pull those up, it's required by federal law. Well, you know, not I, the cables. Not the cables, but any, I'm just saying any part of this, we just want to know this. You have that information, but I'm just starting and getting information here. So I'm trying to read out for myself and for my family here. It's just saying, you know, what is the liability? So I guess the thing is, we just want to understand it. And so we can make the best decision. And so I think that would help too for all our representatives to make sure that the best decision is done for the what's best for the Cape Cod and the, and Massachusetts. Thank you. So those are great questions. There were a few questions in there, and it's entirely possible that I'll answer one and then I won't, I'll need your. No, that's just fine. I'm just saying, you know, things that could be considered for yeah. all of us that are just getting initial. I, I think you're right. Well, all those things are important. Let me just say a few summary things then, because I think you're not so much looking for a direct response from me as you're just raising these are important issues. And that, that's perfect. No. But but I do want to say something about the, the power purchase agreement so people understand um so for both park city and for commonwealth we we bid these contracts uh way back when when we had almost no inflation we had almost zero interest rates and when the wind industry cost curve was going down costs were dropping and you could go back every year and for this project we we bid uh, in that environment, and we were also informed by what our actual costs were for the Vineyard Wind Project, which we're building now. So we had a really good visibility into what the costs of the project looked like, and we bid a number that would be sufficient to cover our costs and give us a decent rate of return. Um, and the revenues coming in from the long-term power purchase agreements would be enough to cover our debt and our equity. And of course, for Vineyard Wind, we had uh, debt financing. And you can imagine, uh, since you're a CPA, that the banks and the lenders took a really hard look at our uh, balance sheets to make sure that what we were saying about revenues covering costs was true. So we, we passed that financial viability test uh, with the lenders, and we got financing for Vineyard Wind, and now we're building it. And that contract will cover those costs because those costs were all locked in uh, years ago. And now the difference between that and Park City and Commonwealth is um, we bid in um, in 2019 for Park City, 2021 for Commonwealth. And of course, the world has changed dramatically, as you well know. Um, part of it is the invasion of Ukraine and what that did to steel prices. Part of it is uh, inflation becoming not a temporary phenomenon, but a seemingly permanent one. And then the Fed uh, with a massive response and in interest rates. So the bottom line is um, we need to renegotiate the prices for these power purchase agreements. We've come out and been very honest about that. The states know that. We're in discussions. At the end of the day, though, uh, in order for us to get financing and close, those contracts have to be sufficient to pay for all of our costs, all of our capital costs, all of our maintenance costs. Um, and all of that, or else we won't be able to go forward. So that is kind of the financial guarantee um, to make sure that we can perform. And above and beyond that, we're going to have insurance policies that will be tapped into if things go wrong. There will be performance guarantees and letters of credit that will be required, um, including bonds and things of that nature for decommissioning the project if it's decided to, at some point, terminate the project. So all of that is going to be in place. But what I'm really saying is the project goes forward if it's financially sound. And the, the, the ultimate arbiter of that is going to be all the lenders who are going to, and, and equity investors who are going to have to decide to put money into the project. Are you going to appeal DPA's decision? We filed an appeal today. You did file today? Yeah. Thank you, Ken. I know we've been wondering. Yeah, I should say, though, that appeal is to preserve our rights. Our goal is not to uh, litigate that issue in the courtroom. Our goal is to work it out with the Commonwealth and the electric distribu uh, distribution companies, utility companies. That you have to fight the DPU. 
Our goal is not to fight the DPU. <laughs> our goal is to preserve our rights and amicably work out all of the issues surrounding the contract. We have no interest in suing the state or having a fight with the DPU. The way I think about that contract is it, the best thing to do would be to put that in the rear view mirror and focus on the future. We understand that. I just want to point out, though, that the invasion of Ukraine happened in, on February 24th. You signed their contracts in May. So you knew about the war. You knew about the possible outcomes. And we're just worried about a company that doesn't stand by its signature. Well, hold on, though. The, the, the contract is informed by the bid. The bid does determine the price. We bid this contract in September. Of, you signed the contract on, in May. Hold on. Contract was was the, the price that we bid was done in September. We had no ability after the bid to say let's let's change it now in the contract that it was what it was. And you know these things um, you don't have a crystal ball. But the key thing that we learned in the summer of 2022 was what the actual prices were going to be for wind turbines and for monopiles and foundations. And I can tell you they were dramatically higher than what Vineyard Wind is paying. Or that what we anticipated would pay in so so a lot changed. Um, and you know, we tried to look at all of these things holistically. Um, and we felt like our bid was sound at the time, and then the, the world changed in a but then dramatic way. signed the contracts anyway, knowing how everything had changed. Well, it, again, in May, it, 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 we signed the contracts in April. It was not apparent in oh, April. On the record, it's May. Yeah, that's it's wrong. It's in April. April. Okay. He says May. Okay. I want to write the quote. Hold on. Yeah. One second. Okay. So can I see hands again? I, I just like to go to some first. Okay. So Pete is not asked a question. Yeah. Excuse me, Pete Hanson. Ken, what percentage on this? What do you rebid? What are you looking for as far as you know, the old uh, contract was denied? What are you looking for for a percentage for an increase? Oh gosh, this is going to be a, a competitive bidding situation. No, I, I really can't. I mean, that the whole idea of a competitive bid is different. Bidders don't know what they're... 10%, 20%? It would be so, on many levels, improper for me to say that in an in a, in a open public bidding process. And and I don't even, I'm not even sure I know the answer to that, but even if I did, that's not something I could say publicly. Uh, Mary Ann, you have a next question? Okay. Yeah, so I just want to speak for Do you guys, like, you can bring up all the democratic political machine, we know they're the ones pushing this through. That doesn't matter. What matters are, you know, whales are showing up dead every day. Fish, all the scientific reports show they are disappearing. Health effects are beginning to show up in 2.5 mile radius for people, which includes basically our entire downtown area from there. And no one is talking about this and it's really, really upsetting. And I think that it needs to be addressed. And Kip addressed, you know, the environment. We are, this was deemed too fragile an ecosystem to consider this. And the water levels are rising. The ocean is acidifying. And in order to create wind power, you need fossil fuel, you need oil, you need gas, you need plastic, you need petrochemicals. It's not green, Kip, sorry, it's not. It's not clean. You need large, huge cement structures. You need coal. Biden wants to open, manufacture eight new manufacturing plants to create the steel and the coal that's going to be needed. That all produces carbon dioxide in, into the air. That's all polluting. That's all contributing to global warming. So, you know, you can't stay green and clean. And, and I want you to address the sea life, and I want to ask you about that ship out there. And I just want to know a little segue from that. Like, who, where is that ship registered? Who is the captain? What kind of anchor system are you using? And where is it registered? So, thank you for the question, Mary. So, first of all, that's a vineyard wind cable laying vessel, or dirt. We do not. So if you go to, I believe, vineyardwind.com, I, I would guess on their fisheries, I can check, and I, I don't have your email, Marianne, but I can find the link. I believe it's probably a mariner notice on vineyardwind.com of who that vessel is um, and who owns it, but that's a vineyard wind vessel that's doing the cable pull operation under the Coco Beach parking lot. And I think there's a couple of support vessels out there too. Um, there is a, a Mariner app I could send you that, or I could look them up myself and send you the names, but it's not owned by Alvin Grid and, and Vineyard Wind is a, a company we only own 50%. Who's registered? Whose flag is it flying? 
I don't know. I'd have to look, Mary, and I, I, I don't know. I don't think any of us in the room know. The, the mayor updates on the maritime laws. It has to be flying a U.S. flag. Yeah. And it has to be made in the United States. Where did that ship come from? Where was it made? I, again, I don't know, Marianne. I don't know, Stacey, if you you're, know? if you know, or you know, yeah, or if you know, yeah. Um, Who's the captain? I, I don't know, Marianne. I, I'll have to point you in the direction if I can get your email address to the, the, the that page, um, and 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 we will find out. Um, I don't know that. I don't think anybody in the room. Knows. Again, I I do think that Vineyard Wind has its own. Public outreach folks yeah. like Nate Mayo and others, who I think you know. So one of Adam Good's subsidiaries does not own Vineyard Wind. Uh, Adam Good's a fifty percent owner. I'm saying that the human beings in this room tonight are not the people who are answering questions about the Vineyard Wind. So that ship out there is not owned by any of Adam Good or Iberdrola's or Orsted's subsidiaries. Well, I don't know about Orsted. So the ship's owned by Orsted. No, <laughs> I don't want to we said we don't, we said we don't know who owns it, but I'm also pointing out there you can get those answers, it's not from us. Okay, let's talk about okay. Right? Thank you so much. Let's move on. So sir in the back and then I'm going to say I'm going to be very brief and yeah. some may think that I'm going to be coming across as crass and frank. Um longtime resident of the cave, happened to be in excavation and construction. Okay. This project, I believe, is totally outrageous. Um, and as a resident. And a Cape Codder, I'm completely against it. I'm going to speak on behalf of a lot of residents. What if I'm a part time resident who don't even some know about what's going on? I feel bad for it, but for those of us that do know about it, totally against it. Yeah. Okay. Totally against it. Understood, sir. Stacey, please go ahead. Hey, thanks. So Amen. we're not really talking a lot about that. And I could go on and on about that. Well, about the beach and the and the fragile ecosystem, a special place it is for all of us. It's a year-round destination for not only the wildlife, but it's for the people who are here for time and gold time. I'm down there all the time, and and this is a little off topic. This is not my special. Sorry about that, but I. I meet people there who can't, they're sandy people, they're elderly people. Dallas's life is their daily destination. Dallas's beach is their daily destination to go for a walk, whether it be with or without uh, their canes. And this is their lifestyle. And by landing it here, you're, we're not just talking about landing it on a straight line beach, as Suzanne has said in the past. The parking lot is part of that, their lifestyle. And I just want you to remember that. That never comes up. It's always about, oh, we're going to create a little path to the handicapped issue here. And it's going to be all okay. But who in the right mind, who's handicapped or not, is going to venture is going to be able to go to Downs Beach when there's a construction zone. Who would want to? Who would want to? But anyway, I'd like to ask my, my question if I may. Of course. Okay. It's a little bit about the same thing. You've been saying that the beach won't be damaged. But in your filing with BOEM, which I'm reading, mm -hmm. I have read your June 2022 COP, the construction operations plan for those of you who haven't quite got me to that. You say damage will be avoided or minimal. What is minimal damage? How do you define that? I'm curious. Well, I believe that that construction operations plan will cover the whole project. First of all, Stacey, congratulate. I know you know say, Rachel and I have seen to know how much time you're spending down there on behalf of Save Dallas's Beach collecting petitions and how much you care about this. So you know, I, to your credit, congratulations. A lot of people in this yeah. room are probably in the same role that I am. I'm a meals and meals driver. Mm -hmm. My client use Dallas's beach sure. three or four times a week. This is their only outlet. And you're taking away from them when you have alternatives that are very clear. And I respect you, Ken, for when you say, oh no, there really aren't any alternatives. There are. Dallas, you can go elsewhere. Dallas's beach is too fragile. It's too risky to do it there. It's too special. It's too yeah. special. It's it is part of the lifestyle of Barnstable residents. So when you ruin it, it's too late. 
So, yeah. so not to see more of the environmental studies. I'm just really good. I'm just trying to see them. I'd love to see them. But honestly, you have other options. And this is one lifestyle of, of Kate, not only Barnes Noble, but Kate Cut. And thank you for the reference to me being down there. But it's been the most gratifying thing of this project is for me to meet so many wonderful people that have been down there. And they're not just down laying out on the sand. Like I said, they go there and this is their break during the day. But they sit in, they sit in their cars in the parking lot sometimes. They hang out on that causeway. They fish. They go to the fishing rooms. They mm -hmm. fish. It's not just your typical right. spot. And you have you have other alternatives. You do. We all know that. We're we're pretty well educated in the on that. So it's somewhat insulting sometimes, to be honest. When you say, "Oh, we don't have any other place to go," you do. You do. In, in the cause. Maybe just the Hold on, Mary. Thank you, Mary. Stacy, thank you for your passion. And, and clearly, everyone in the room understands how, how much you care about this. So, and, you know, we just, some members of our team spent a whole time down there, not, not near as what you do and folks in this room do. So we get it and we understand it. And we've seen those of us who spend time down there, we see the beauty of the environment and the habitats surrounding the parking lot. I think we view it differently. And we are are permitting. Sorry, pardon me. Pardon me. Oh, you got it. You got it. Hold on, hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Right. Yes. Gotten a little late. Pardon me. We hold on. Hold on. Hold on. We view the parking lot usage of the parking lot differently the way you're describing, Stacy. Um, we view that this is a tried and tested method of horizontal directional drilling under a paved parking surface. It's a construction zone for three years with from which by the way implies that Dallas Beach is only important to our community during the summer. And, that's the 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 and we know that we 100 percent 100 percent understood. And we've seen we know we understand that people all throughout the day, during all the winter months, walk there, spend time there, everything you described completely. What we're saying is we view the usage of the parking lot and landing this infrastructure under the parking lot on the causeway differently than how you do. We do not view it as a, as a threat to the, the surrounding natural environments, the beach and the dunes and, and the bays, et cetera, and the, and the wildlife. And we're gonna have rigorous permitting on this and proving our position that this is a viable place and way to land this infrastructure under the paved parts and surface. I think this is a productive. Yeah, I, I think we're getting a little bit into a shouting match. Okay. I mean, I'm but no, 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 but but you you know we got to listen. We are we're we're required. We're we're required, we're, 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 we're required to share with you all the alternatives we've looked at. That's going to be in writing. We're going to we're going to do the whole analysis of the alternatives and and where we came out. And if we have a disagreement about that, we can have that disagreement. Could can you clarify just uh, during what time of year and for how many yeah. months mm -hmm. will we be doing the construction? Yeah. 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 Yes. Yeah. So we anticipate onshore construction, including within the Dowsers Beach lot, starting sometime in the fall of 2025. Um, the previous host community agreements, I think, put September 15th to May 15th um, as the construction periods. So during during that fall 25 into spring 26, maybe the spring between September 25 to May 26, would when we do the first year of onshore construction, it would be two years, not three. Um, so there'd be a second year into 26 into 27 during that September, two consecutive September to May months. Um, we, as I went over in the presentation earlier, would plan to do the three horizontal directional drills into the beach parking lot underneath the beach and the dunes um, during that first year between 25 to 26. Um, during a several month period, we would try to get it done as quickly and safely as possible so that we could wrap that up and re fully reopen the beach parking lot. Um, and then it would be I think we're estimating some time, maybe around a six week period where we'd be within the causeway. Um, we wanna be on the maybe six to eight weeks 
Um, as currently proposed, if we were installing the duct bank within the causeway and over top the culvert, um, that would be the only period where we're proposing to close where the lot would be inaccessible because we'd okay. be within the causeway. You know, I, if yeah. I could just yeah. ask, Please. there are a couple of areas that seem very unclear to me, but if you could clarify that in writing, mm -hmm. I think that would be helpful. Sure. Can I have another comment to this? Hold on, sorry, and then you there, there were a bunch of questions that were asked about uh, the cost of upgrading the grid associated with your project. And, uh, you know, isn't it true that, that you're responsible for yeah. not only the cost to get the power to the grid, but the cost of upgrading the grid so it can accept the power? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. We are. That, that wasn't That's our responsibility. Okay. Yeah. Good. All right. I some more be, hands. I, I might be wrong on this, Pat. Okay. The last meeting mm -hmm. that I was with with you folks, that's what you just said, I think is different than what you said originally. Okay. Originally, there was conversation about 90 days. That's crazy. Mm -hmm. Best month for one thousand beach is September. Mm -hmm. But I, I think I recall you talking about sometime in October to sometime in early April yes. as the window. Okay. I might be wrong. But now, all of a sudden, earlier in your presentation, you talked about June, July, and August. Now we're talking about September 15th. So it's your next presentation. Mm -hmm. Could you have in writing what the plan is so that we all know? I don't think we can get to, I mean, I'm, all I meant, I think Paul, right? Yes. Um, in terms of the difference of starting September 15th or at some time in October, I don't know if we're to that level of detail yet. I, while I was thinking about those dates, those are the dates in the host community agreements for the first two projects. Um, if I said April, okay. October to April at the pr previous meeting, I'll go back and watch the video That's on right. the libraries. And then the only other request I'll have for the second meeting is to see a slide uh, we already have, had a request on the financial. Mm -hmm. Could we see a slide on, you know, the strategy around, you know, if if it hits the fan? By the way, I'm against the project, but if it hits the fan, who do we go after? And I worked for an international life insurance company. We had LLCs everywhere, and we had them for a reason. Okay, and. It was to protect the enterprise, and if something had to go down, it went down. So, if you could demonstrate what, however, you're going to get to use bonds, reinsurance, mm -hmm. you know, whatever that is, uh, you know, if we end up with heaven forbid sickness that comes as a result, you know, just let us see the uh, mitigation of the risk from, from our end. If we've gotten that question from uh, quite a number of people, we will. We'll, yeah. we'll respond to it. Okay, I'm going to do a couple more in Zoom and then go back to the room. Uh, Steve, go ahead. Um, so going back to our previous question about costs on the substation, he wants to know about the impacts and the cost of land procurement. Impacts and the cost of land procurement. I don't know if you want to... Well, the cost of land procurement is not something we can share publicly. That's that's discussions with landowners. In terms of the impacts, do you want to address it? Yeah, so we're clear? we're we're purchasing land across from the existing Eversource substation adjacent to the existing power lines right of way that Eversource maintains um, from private landowners. And the reason we chose that particular site is that we could uh, shield it um, from public view. Um, we could keep it. From, uh, from the roadways. Uh, we could keep it away from um, existing homes and neighborhoods, um, which is a key criteria, um, and uh, suppress the sound with sound from the substation with a mix of sound walls um, and natural uh, barrier from, from woods and uh, keeping it away from existing homes and roadways. Um, so that was a criteria we looked at um, to minimize impacts, which the, the impacts we're trying to avoid are uh, sight from the roadways, Noise that's a nuisance, light that's a nuisance, et cetera, um, and that's the that's the point of shielding it, um, and why why we chose uh, that site and we filed that, that that with the Energy Facility Setting Board that that's our uh, that's our chosen site for this project substation. We'll go to another Zoom question, and then you, sir. Our last question here: Who are the companies collecting offshore and onshore survey data for you? And what is the contractor selection process? 
onshore and offshore survey. So not, this is not a fisheries question. So this would be survey data relative to, I think geotechnical survey land or sort of like soil sampling is my guess. Um, we folks might be aware of this, that we did some borings in the Douses Beach parking lot and causeway back in the spring of last year and the, the fall last year, I don't remember exactly when, um, and on some roadways that was done by ADT, um, and uh, I can't remember their names. We have to have to look them up. Um, those subcontractors. We do it through Mott McDonald is the master contractor that we did that through. Um, they subvendored to ADT Aqua Aquatechnical or something technical drilling. And those work notices are also on our website. So when the work is ongoing, they're up on our website and then they're also archived as well. So um, to, the, to the vessel question, kind of any vessels or kind of onshore, offshore geotech stuff, we, when we have work going on, the, cert, the information's up. And then when they're archived, they're still available. Good. Okay. Uh, sir, please. Yeah, I have a couple of questions. Yeah. Um, number one, with respect to the override possibility, mm -hmm. if our town elected officials uh, turn this down and say we, we don't want this in our town uh you have the right to go to the efsb and they potentially have an overwrite capability override capability do they yes. have to go to the state legislature for that yes. approval no. or do they have the authority to do on their own i'm sorry the siting board itself can override a, a, a local community it is it is and, an the, and we have no recourse you can you can appeal it and then I go to the legislature at that point? No, then it goes to the state Supreme Court. So it go to the land court, basically. Not land court, state judicial, Supreme Judicial Court. Okay. Interesting. Uh, and the second question, relative to the, the heat question that was asked earlier, you kind of dodged the question in my mind. Um, you said that the farther you get away from the duck bank, the heat would dissipate. I've asked that, how hot is the duck bank going to be? He's talking about magnetic field. She, when she talked about dissipation away, that was level of magnetic. I, I, get, I get the dissipation. Yeah. The farther away, yeah. the cooler it is. But forgive me, I, I don't have that number. Uh, but we, uh, again, we, we do, Jan, I'm, trying, I'm, trying, I'm trying to answer your question as best I can. Forgive me. Um, we, we do uh, postulate and calculate what those will be. And certainly the heat does dissipate. We do use thermal concrete mm -hmm. as a way of trying to dissipate the heat. We work very carefully with the interfacing utilities, both on the water side, the gas side, et cetera. Make sure that there be no detriment to anything that's on the ground, whether it's a material thing of that nature. So it is it is an issue that the Ivan Grid handles very carefully. Okay, still haven't answered the question. How deep, how hot are the cables? I, I will have to get back to okay. them. How hot the cable be? That must be a now the extent. Do you mean in terms of the degree? Of the answer. Yeah. I'd rather not give you the wrong number. I'd rather get that. You guys about heat, how how much heat in, in terms of the temperature? Yeah. Of the yeah. But you guys might be like in the They're going to be a temperature when they're full of electricity, correct? I mean, no, and once it's buried in the ocean and subsea or subterranean, uh, there's a heat dissipation there. It's going to heat the water surrounding, heat, heat the soil around, it, heat the duct tank. We'll have to get you those numbers. I, we yeah. just don't, I don't want to call. Sir, I don't know if I if you if I give you my business card so we can follow up. So I, or I can get your email address. I'd like to follow up, please. Yeah. Okay, Pete, and then you, and then I'm going to take three more, and then we're going to call it for the night if that's okay. So Pete, sir, question for you, Ken. When is the rebidding process, or when is the date on that, and what happens if you do not get the bid? What happens? If, uh, I'm out of a job. No, I'm kidding. Um, what happened? Yeah, yeah. Um, the Commonwealth is required by law to do another solicitation in April of this year. And we're recommending that whatever amount they were planning on procuring, they add our capacity, the 1200 to it and put out a solicitation. Um, and so if they adhere to that recommendation, it will go out to bid sometime in the spring. When will you know? That's a good question. Uh, I asked uh, some folks at Vineyard when, how long did the whole process take? And it's about a six month process. So we'll know towards the end of the year. You're gonna be fined and allowed to bid. That's the decision being made right now. Do you know if they've made that decision? Are we gonna be allowed to bid? Correct. That's what we read in the newspapers that DPU is deciding whether they're going no. to find you. And, and Jeffrey Rue is working on this. No, no. He D said what he wants to see happen is they're going to find your company 
because you didn't adhere to the contract you signed, and he wants to see you fined, and then the love's bid in April. That's what's in the newspaper. Is that completely wrong? No, it's not. He, he said we should be allowed to bid. We should not be disqualified from bidding. One of the points he made, which I agree with, there aren't that many bidders. Um, the more bidders you have, the more competition, the lower the price. So um, if this contract is terminated, there are penalties in the contract that we have to pay. That's what I'm talking it's about. That, it's that straightforward. I mean, it's a contract and we have a penalty we have to pay. Yeah, okay. But but that's different from saying you can't bid. No, no, he's yeah. saying that you know, we should be fined but allowed to bid. Yeah, the, I guess the only quibble I'm having is the word fined. I guess it's a fine, but to me, yeah, it's it a is. penalty that the contract provides for and we're, we're gonna- right. You should be financially penalized. Yes. And allowed yeah. to bid. We will be. All right, so I'm gonna do, well, actually, man, you never got, you, know, you first thing yeah. you started to Nobody's talking about the elephant in the room. And a lot of us are aware that your parent company, Avangrid, has been known for racketeering in Maine and violations in Connecticut. We have some elected officials and representatives here. Will you be trying to influence the people that we have elected? So, ma'am, racketeering is a very strong word. It is. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I would like to see, and perhaps you have the courtesy to send me any documents that you have that suggest it's that? It's in Maine. Well, I, I'd love to see documentation that we are guilty of. Company. Well, I'd like to see that documentation that Avangrid committed the crime of racketeering. Because um, I haven't heard that. Um, it's in terms of fines, I, I also don't know what you're referring to. So I'm happy to. Violations in Connecticut. As a utility company? Well, okay. But, you know, I'm sure there's ever source has been fined. And so is, I mean, you may wield with our elected officials to try to win their viewpoints. Uh, you know, my view of state officials is they're going to do what they think is right and what's in the interest of their community. And we have an argument to make that this project is really important for the country and the world. I'm going to interrupt for a second. I mean, what is your name? Cynthia. I said, yeah. I'm Rep. Kip Diggs, and I'm not going to kid you. I'm listening to everyone here. Yeah. I mean, I, I, you guys voted for me. I work for you. Okay, so I'm respecting that. But I also know that, unfortunately, let's see, 20 years ago, I was in high school, 30 years ago, I was in high school. We had issues back then that we know known about. And now there's an issue that we've been, things have been running, we've been making money, things have been going on. Now we have an issue we need to take care of and we need, to, we need some help. So this is a way that we could get some help. And I understand that we don't want to maybe have it here with another area. I just another don't way. want our officials to be knocking from. I'm just saying, well, you're saying, well, I'm going to say, let's move on. Both well, we have environmentally unsuitable for landing. But, well, I guess, I guess what I'm telling you, I honestly feel that we need to go ahead and really put. X's and X's together so that we can actually see it so that we can find out. Because honestly, having a meeting yesterday, two days ago, I was here and it was a big meeting. Okay. And it said one, it was, it was more of a, it was more of a rah, rah, rah type of thing. Wait a minute, wait a minute. It's was, it was, it was all, it was only information on one side. It wasn't made on on both sides. So I need to have more information. We need, no, not I. We need to have information on both sides so that we can go ahead and say, okay, this is not true because this, this is this. And then we can say, okay, yes, or yay or nay or whatever. That's why I feel is the best way to go about it instead of, let me serve you something. Let me, let me volley back to something else. We, we have to come up with, with common sense stuff. Thank you, Rush. So last two questions, sir, and then I'm in. Um, just when the uh, tables that run through the uh, residential neighborhood, are they going to be encased in conduits, gas and steam conduits to eliminate, to limit the EMF coming out of the table? Yes, the, uh, the way the, the duct bank will be constructed yes. is a trench will be dug. She, and then I, I will it be, it'll be encased in stainless steel. Uh, yeah, no, we, we watch through it. Kind of. uh, they'll be conduit. They're actually going to be PVC. Polyvinyl. They're, they're, they're not steel. They're made of steel. What else is they used to be? Uh, 
more ones that work. Uh, yeah, no, uh, PVP has been, been used uh, in the power and, and transmission industry for quite, quite a while now. Uh, they get placed in the duct bank. Uh, they're spaced about roughly one foot apart in the center. Uh, thermal concrete is, is placed over them. And, and then you, you use the gas and you use it to cut down on the heat. Right. Again, the, I, I think the way we've accommodated that is by the use of thermal concrete uh, to dissipate the heat. There's one more question. That's a question, ma'am, please. And I'm sorry, my name is Catherine Mean Patrick. Oh, yeah. Thanks, Catherine. So, one of the things kind of goes on what Stacey said, but, um, and I think we've kind of gone around it, but what do you guys have in Grant? What does your company, how do you feel about the community resistance to this project? You know, um, do you en not entertain it, but I, it doesn't matter, I guess. And I, I go back to that first meeting that I went to, and Ken, you made the comment that this project was approved unanimously by our town council. And your comment was you, it was voted unanimously for by your town council, and you all voted your town councilors in. So, you know, we feel bamboozled, in fact, because it wasn't, you know, we were all told it was a done deal back in August. But how do you guys feel about the resistance that you're feeling and the information that we're sharing with you? Does that carry any weight with Avangrid, Avangrid LLC, Avangrid, the state of Massachusetts, um, you know, our governor, all of that? Because there are, there is an alternative um, route you could take, which goes into, you know, I hate to say New Bedford, but that's an, it's an industrialized area. This is a residential tourist area. Like, why can't it be, it's like trying to put a 200-acre uh, farm in Manhattan. It just doesn't fit, you know, when there are other options for them. Look, I'll, I'll give it a shot. Um, we do care what the community has to say. That's why we're here. That's why we're listening. That's why we're engaging. That's why we're reading comments. That's why we're uh, trying to answer questions as well as we can. And that's why we continue to really want to have a conversation about ways in which we can support the local community to address something that we've never denied, which is there will be an inconvenience and disruption to people. People who love that beach, there'll be certain times of the year where they're not going to enjoy it as much. And, and that there's no way around that. And we've been playing about that from the beginning. I think where we differ is we don't think we're going to have any permanent detrimental impact at all. And we think that the benefits that we're bringing in terms of the sewer and the money and other things outweigh it. Now that's that's our interpretation. We know it's different from yours. I hope through continued dialogue that we can get closer. I'm still very eager to hear about some local mitigation or some local benefit that we could do to compensate for the disturbance. But but anyway, so so that's the way in which All right, let me finish. I, Okay. I just wanted to explain thing. Are you guys investigating? Are you doing active investigation of I know you said the subtreatments are on cost billions, but are you guys actively work. investigating doing it in the New Bedford area? So no, I, I think we've been clear, Pat was clear that the New Bedford one is the same thing as what we're calling the Kushnet. There's a substation there that has capacity for 400 megawatts. It's not going to be able to take the whole project. But could you reduce the size of the project? The 400 megawatts? Yeah. yeah, but then there'd be 800 megawatts less of clean energy yeah, going to the Commonwealth. No. Anyway, look, look, we, the burden is on us through this permitting process to demonstrate that we picked the best alternative. Different people will disagree. You'll have an opportunity to make those arguments. Can I go to Yarmouth? And Yarmouth, talk, talk, you know, was, was opposed to it as well. And as was publicly stated by our town manager, he was asked to go talk with Avangrid at the direction of our town council without anyone really knowing, <laughs> sadly. And that's not that's on us. Well, that's on us. I think you're talking about Vineyard Win One. Well, that, that you won't percent. No, but that's not the same thing as this project. And one other thing I just wanted to get at. But that is how Avangrid was introduced to Barnstable. And that may be true. And Vineyard Win One is wonderful, project, but that's enough of a sacrifice for us for this. Community. It's enough. I hear you. Community. There's just one one other piece I just want. 
at thousand feet. Where are your slides with the ecosystem at, at thousand feet? Where are those slides? Where, I mean, yes, I so appreciate the opportunity to, to look at, you know, to look at your studies. I would, I think we all would. Oh, but why is it never addressed? It, it, again, the, the work we're talking about is in the parking lot. It's not in a wetland. It's not in a swamp. It's not in a river. And it's that, that's just the point. All, all of those, all of that will be addressed in our environmental reports. I have one last, one pause, one last thing I want to say before we, we, before we adjourn. Wait, this is the most important thing. We have beautiful cookies and baked goods that I don't want to go to waste. Could everyone at least grab one on their way home so we don't take them all home? Just very briefly, our next meeting will be February 23rd, 5 p.m. here. This video tonight will be on the YouTube page from the library. And please, everyone, get home safe. Yeah. Hey, Larry.